Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to the science fiction audiobook version of the fourth wave taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 101, written by Semi Loki. The voices were that woke me up, just not all at once. I first became aware of them as a distant thing, something that rose and fell in pitch with the strange cadence of the sounds. Other than recent psychic showdowns, I really didn't have much experience with the ocean, which is probably why the image of the surf crashing against the beach was not the first one that sprang to mind. Instead, I thought of something that I was familiar with. Cars. I was listening to traffic flowing by. It was far away, perhaps on the street just outside the window. Those strange patterns of spots and starts were due to traffic lights. It made sense. I was familiar. It was good. I could relax. But I didn't because the cars didn't sound quite right. I didn't know why, so I listened closer. Gradually, the drone of the engines mixed with the hum of the tires on the pavement and began to separate into distinct choppy sounds. Words. I was listening to the language of cars. Served as a distraction, one car was saying. It gave me room to move and think. I didn't have that before, and he was constantly focusing on crushing me. Once the pressure let up, I was able to breathe again. So all of this were really just, um... The voices trailed off again, the exhausting trying to follow the conversation. I was actually slightly disappointed. I had been hoping to find out what the secret cars told one another. The best spots for a quart of oil, how to get rid of that annoying knock while you're dridling, or why when driving 10 miles per hour the fast lane was so important to keep the left blinker on the whole time. Instead, this seemed like an ordinary, everyday chatter. Maybe cars liked small talk just as much as people do. Maybe I should say something to them. How do you say hi in car? Rev rev vroom was there in the epilogical honk at the end of the sentence to indicate it was a question. I decided to listen a bit more to get a better sample, lest I say something embarrassing, like tell the Cadillac like his father was a larder and his mother smelled of diesel. I focused a bit more. Kind of, one of them was saying, I'm not sure, no one ever told me how to do this, there's sort of this warm fuzzy spot right here, I think I might be one of the cats, I'm trying to focus on it, it just runs away. It was too much work, I lost track of the voices again. Well, at least my eavesdropping would reveal one vital clue. The cars actually aimed for the cats, that was huge, I could have called up the human society and let them know, maybe they could sue the car manufacturers, then again maybe that would be a bad idea. The cars would wonder who revealed the secret. If I got brought up on the witness stand and they would know I learned their language and put them hit on me. I'd have to ask for the witness protection program to send me to live amongst the Amish. It was the only place they could guarantee my safety. I'd have to grow my beard out and wear one of those floppy hats. I'd be given a new name like Ephraim Yoda. No one would ever suspect good old Yef Yoda was secretly a car talker who brought down the autumn officio. I'd learn all about woodworking and a farmer, and every time they sent the carriage into town, I'd tag along and listen to the cars. Listening to what new plots they had in store, I'd... Uh, someone laughed. Oh no, I thought, they found me. Somehow they found me. I was sloppy. They're here. I woke in a blind panic. As I sat up, I shouted at the top of my lungs, Get inside the barn and bar the door, Gunther. I opened my eyes and found myself in a cavern of the door and vengeance, with five pair of eyes staring at me. Well, the professor said at last, it looks like Jason's finally awake. Lee nodded and stood up. His chair seemed to have grown from a rock floor itself, as he stood melted and oozed back into the ground. The professor and Jack stood up as well. We should go, Lee said quickly. Yes, the professor agreed. I think Jason and Heather have a lot to discuss. All right, Shide said. Have a good time. He then settled back into his chair and flashed me a knowing grin. Before I could articulate a response, Jack was at his side, tugging on his left ear. Kavodge! He shouted, fine, I'm going, I'm going! Let the Kavodge go! Jack didn't comply. Instead, she dragged him all the way out of the lift where the professor and Lee were waiting for her. Jack tossed her sweeping prisoner to the top of the platform before leaping on it herself. The lift slid upwards noiselessly. It happened so fast that it took me a full minute to realize I was staring at an empty shaft that the lift had just occupied and I was alone in a room with Heather. The last time we'd been left alone hadn't worked out so well, so I whipped my head around to make sure that she wasn't about to stab me. 
This ended up being a mistake on two fronts. First, and most importantly, it made my head swim. I guess I wasn't completely recovered from whatever knocked me out. If I'd been under attack, that would have cost me my life. Fortunately, all I did was give a splitting headache and a drunken-eyed view of the second reason whooping my head around like that was a mistake. Heather's cheeks were blazing red. She was embarrassed, and somehow my nausea-inducing headache turned had made things worse. Maybe she saw suspicion in my eyes when I looked at her. Or, more than likely, she just hated that I caught her blushing. Either way, I didn't say anything for a long time, mostly because I was afraid if I part my teeth, I would spew chunks of last night's dinner all over her. If I had ate anything last night, when had I last eaten anything? Ron suits make things very confusing. They can be such asses sometimes, Heather said and shook her head with a wry grin. I think they half expect us to get reacquainted with the horizontal tango. FYI, when your eyeballs snapped out of your sockets like a Roger Rabbit, kinda hurts. She sighed. I guess I need to start from the beginning with you, she said, apparently half to herself. I don't realize how much I was dreading this until just now. Heather, I managed to stammer. She nodded her head and then caught herself, then bit her lip. Mostly, she said. Not entirely, though. Call it 98% Heather and 2%, well, raging psychopathic jerk seems to be a bit too strong. Call it Essence of Fae. Heather, I repeated. I hadn't thought a better thing to say, so just winging it now. She smiled at me and stroked my cheek. Close enough, she assured me. W what happened? I asked. Her smile broke. A wave of sadness washed over her face. I wanted to take back the question, but I didn't. I knew that she didn't want to talk about it, but I still had to know. You already know most of it, she said with the last of a shrug, and then looked away from me. Between my anxiety and the general sense of terror that we were experiencing when the space elevator exploded, Ak Lerakter managed to implant a small germ of himself in my head. She tapped her forehead with emphasis and then fell silent. What? Was that all she had to say? Fortunately, she was just gathering her thoughts and continued on her own. I thought it was just my imagination at first, she said. She was still not meeting my eyes, at least she was talking. It wasn't even a whisper at first, she went on. Just weird moments when I almost did something but changed my mind at the last minute. Subtle things. I thought it was just stress. I'd start to say one thing and say something else entirely. Emotional things. I felt oddly suspicious of my friends. You, especially. I was angry with you and I didn't know why. I kept telling myself I was being unreasonable, but it wouldn't go away. By the time I realized that these thoughts weren't coming from me, it was too late. I wanted to say something, but uh, couldn't. So all the punching and kicking, I asked. That wasn't you, it was him. Well, you jokes are terrible, she said. Heather. Okay, she said. It was mostly him. Partially, it was my dad. How did your dad work into this conversation, I asked. She shrugged. That's why it took me so long to realize that I had an uninvited guest, she said. Someone using my dad's voice is telling me not to trust people near me, and that you are the biggest loser to ever besmirch the face of the earth. How am I supposed to tell the difference between Tur and the one who normally here? Your dad really hated me that much, I asked. I knew he disliked me, but why did he let me work for his company if he hated me? He said that it was safer having you someplace where he could keep an eye on you, rather than letting you run wild, she admitted. He just made sure that he kept you isolated and shot down in the attempt to promote you. Promote me? I asked. They were going to offer me a promotion. Twice, she said with a nod and frown. Well, sort of. You applied for two different positions that were promotions. You made the cut and they were going to interview you. He told them to reject your application both times. Son of a witch! I thought the man was Satan before, but now I was certain he actually gave Satan his marching orders. If there was a black hole of selfishness and arrogance in the universe, Heather's father would be the ego sitting right in the middle of it. What the hell did I ever do to him? I blurted out. Junior year, she said. Mark Kyle. The name didn't ring any bells at the moment that I remembered. Preppy type kid, I asked, captain of the debate team. She nodded. His father was a junior partner and one of the larger law firms, she agreed. We started dating sophomore year. Dad's idea. He liked the idea of me associating with the right kind of people. Our people, he liked to call them. I never even talked to Mark, Kyle, I said. I didn't even know that you were going out with him. What the hell does that have to do with anything? No, she said. You just gave me a ride home when you saw me walking in the rain. I was getting mental whiplash from the way that she was leaping from topic to topic, with seemingly no common ground between them. 
What are you talking about? I asked. It was early March, she said. I was freezing, but not by much. A huge storm rolled in and you were delivering pizzas. What? I asked as I searched my memory. I only did that job for like six weeks. My car broke down after that and I couldn't get it fixed. Oh, wait. What? I think I remember. You were out in the 190, walking and was soaked to the bone. You didn't have a jacket or anything. She smiled. No, I didn't, she agreed. You said that you were coming back from a delivery. The guy refused to pay for some stupid reason, so you took a pizza and left. That, I remember, the jerk had tried to tell me that I was Nate. I pointed out that we had told him that it would be 45 minutes, and I got there in 43 minutes, which meant that I was actually Ernie. He tried to say the pizza was supposed to be there in 30 minutes or less. I tried several times to point out that there was a guarantee made by a different chain, one that had been discontinued no less, and that he had agreed to the time frame when he had ordered. He had argued and insisted the pizza was free. I thanked him for the free pizza and walked off eating a slice. He called in to complain on my drive back, and I had gotten writ up for it. Totally worth it. And as I thought back to it, though, I could not recall that I picked up Heather on the drive back and gave her a lift home. You said a friend was supposed to pick you up, but you couldn't get a hold of her. I said, thinking back, and I offered to drive you home instead. She nodded. She still wasn't meeting my gaze. You drove me home, she said. You cranked up the heater in the car so I would warm up. You lent me your jacket and even offered me some of the guy's pizza. You told me what happened and what you did, and I laughed. I shrugged. If you say so, I said. I'm sorry, I, but I don't remember much about it. I was just giving someone a lift home. It was along the way. Well, mostly. She lowered her eyes and glared at her feet. That's just it, she said. It wasn't a big deal for you. You just did it to be nice. You even offered to let me keep the jacket so I could keep out of the rain until I got into the house. I told you I couldn't get any more wet than I already was, and it wasn't that far to go. I hugged you and said thank you and ran inside. Okay, I said. Look, I'm enjoying this, but what does this have to do with your father? He saw me hug you, she said. He was watching from the window when you drove up. Probably was debating calling the police on you. He'd take one look at your clunker and assume that you were there to plan a robbery or something. But he noticed me sitting in the passenger seat first. He watched us and then he saw me hug you and he was furious. Wait, I stammered. You hugged me and they hated me ever since. Not just that, she said with a sigh. It's what happened next. Next? I asked. Her lips twitched in a parody of a smile. I lied to you then, she said. I wasn't waiting on a friend. Mark had drove me out there where we were supposed to go to a movie. He had, um, um, other ideas. I wasn't ready for that and I said no. He kicked me out of the car and told me to walk back in the rain to teach me a lesson. I was freezing and crying my eyes out when you drove up. Rain is a good place to cry if you ever need to hide it quickly. I got into the car and you were a perfect gentleman. You were nice to me. You didn't need a reason to just be nice. You just were. You didn't try to take advantage of me. You didn't ask for anything in return. It was such a contrast to what Mark had just done to me. That, well, when my dad demanded to know what I was doing, I was riding around in that sort. I tore into him. I told him exactly what Mark did to me. Everything. I can understand why he would be angry with Mark, but why, uh... I began. He wasn't angry with Mark, she interrupted. He was angry with me. I was wrong yet again. Satan at least shows an interest in humans. Sure, as a target for corruption, but at least he notices human beings are alive. This was far more of a removed level of evil. He said if I handled it poorly, she said, that if I was my fault for allowing myself to be made a victim, I should have taken control of the situation. We fought for hours after that. It was the only time in my life I ever argued with my father. I told him how you were a gentleman at least, and he twisted everything back on me. He told me that you weren't being a gentleman. You were just playing your own game, and I was the prize. He said that you played me, and I fell for it. He said that I was going to be nothing but a victim all my life if I didn't learn how to understand people. I fell silent. The hell can I say? We argued for a long time, she went on. Then I stopped arguing. Like an idiot, I started listening. He told me that I must have been leading on Mark, and he half convinced me. It was my fault, not Mark's, mine, for not handling it correctly. He demanded I call Mark right up then and then apologize. He made me do it. I hated him for it, but I hated myself more. Mark agreed to still see me after I begged him to forgive me. We went out three more times. Nothing happened, so he dumped me for someone where things would happen. My father simply shrugged it off and told me that it wasn't important as Mark was good enough to date, but not good enough to marry. 
He was simply there to regain exposure to our people. You listened to this? I asked. How could anyone listen to such nonsense and not realize their father was crazy? How could she not rebel? The obvious answer hit me a moment before Feather voiced it. My mother told me I should. She made a soft voice that was barely above a whisper. She told me he knew what he was talking about. It was like being punched in the gut over and over again. Heather's father, pure evil. Her mother, a saint. Heather may have been mixed feelings towards a father. How could she not? But not towards a mother. The woman was too wonderful not to love. Unfortunately, her mother did have one flaw. She was too damn loyal to her husband. Her feelings towards the man weren't up to for debate and... By extension, neither were Heather's. Dad made sure to use you as an example of everything that was wrong with those sorts of versus our people, she said. For weeks, he made sure I saw every flaw possible in you. He made sure I understood what a narrow escape I had accepting the right from you. He would rather you walked home in the rain, I asked with stunned disbelief. He would rather I not show any sort of affection to someone from a lower station, she corrected me. If I hadn't hugged you, then I think his reaction might have been different. He might have just dismissed the whole event, but I think he was worried I might be attracted to you and wanted me to nip that in the bud. Again, don't do Roger Rabbit thing, it smarts. He tried to sabotage my career, I stammered. My life, because of a hug. She chuckled. It was a sickly sounding thing. Funny, she said. I don't think I realized that before, but yes. Essentially, that was it. To him, it was just made sense. Your life was unimportant except as an example to me. I think I may have a stab him in the face the next time I see him, I blurted out. You can't, Jason, she declared and whirled around me. You will do nothing to my father, you understand that. I, I, I was just dumb, I stuttered. That's my job, she said angrily. He's dumb for, he's ruined, it comes from me. Okay, this is definitely a change from the old Heather. Um, I asked at last. You said that there was 2% change. She laughed. This time, it was a real laugh. She reached over and took my hand and squeezed it hard. Thank you, she said. I needed that. I'll break it to her later that I wasn't joking. I pushed on. So, you're angry with your father now, I asked. I was always angry with him, she corrected me. It's just that I wasn't sure if he wasn't the right for some level. I mean, he's my father. I've listened to that crap all my life. It's only now that I'm able to realize just how much a crap really is. I would have thought the Fae would be right there and nodding along with you, I muttered. He probably could give them pointers about being a prick. That's sort of the point, she said. Think of it for a moment. How do you get rid of an invader in your mind? You tear out everything that isn't yours and cast it out. That's how. You look at everything that is false and that doesn't feel like you. And you pile it up the reason after reason that it doesn't belong to you until you push it out. It's like condensing a lifetime and debating with yourself into one spot. Except you do it over and over again until you rout the bastard. But, I said, you did say that you routed him. You said you ate him. How does that work? She looked thoughtful. I think, she said at last, it was something I picked up from him. Chimera digest their prey, take part of it and themselves stronger. I did the same for him. They aren't Chimera, I protested. No, she agreed, just engineered to chimeric ideas. I don't know. I just know that for weeks he had been battering away at me and enjoying the, what was him, forcing me back into a more and more remote corner of my mind. I kept losing ground, I was exhausted and I looked for so much effort to keep part of myself me, that I kept surrounding bits and pieces of myself so that I could focus on the core parts. He didn't need to sleep, I did. Every time I relaxed he'd hit me with much harder. I was fighting him in my dreams so I was tired and thought for sure that I was done for. Then he stepped in and gave him a different target for a while. And, I asked, she flashed me an evil grin. And I wasn't about to let him do that to me again, she confirmed. So, I let you take a beating for a while, as I figured out how to get the hang of things. Her eyes went wide as she realized what she said. Uh, sorry about that, she said quickly. I don't mean to. I waved her into silence. I was sort of the plan anyway, I told her. I was acting as a tackling dummy while the Ron cut him out. Her shoulder stumped slightly. A tightness that I hadn't noticed before had left. Wait, she thought I would be mad at her for that. I'm sorry anyway, she admitted. I wasn't sure that I could have helped that point anyway. I didn't have access to the telepathic lobe just then. I was only when he wasn't focused entirely on me that I was able to use the back door. Your brain, your rules, I asked. Something like that, she replied. 
more like I knew the layout better than he did. Anyway, I got myself into a good position and decided to kick butt. I nodded in agreement. That you did, I said. Rather impressive, really. How much of that was I seeing was real? What did you see? She asked. A beach, a tornado, and origami birds, I said. She shook her head. I didn't see any of that, she replied. To me, it was a large chunk of not me hacking away at something that had a tiny sliver of me inside of it, if that makes any sense. Actually, in a weird way, that made perfect sense. We always claim that our friends and loved ones carry a tiny piece of ourselves inside of them. Maybe, with the telepaths, it was a lot more literal, but that brought up another point. Are you telepathic now? I asked her. She bit her lip again. I think so, she admitted. The run, they said my mind has restructured itself and can't be put back. Not without wiping my memories and putting Jerk Loracter back. I can't be entirely for certain, as if it's just us, the cats and the Ron here, right now, and telepathy doesn't work on you and the Ron. The Ron are immune to telepathy, I asked. Not immune, she corrected me. Their minds are more spread out. They aren't housed in a single body. It makes it a lot harder to break into that. Telepathically, it seems a sort of like a... Well, like an induction of neurons without making the direct contact. I can sort of remotely feel what is going on in the head, and if I push, I can get the thoughts and mirror what I'm pushing. It's hard to explain, but the point is that it doesn't work on you and the others and the Ron and half the neurons of vocalized thoughts. I'd have to hit several minds at once to either push or pull thoughts, and I'm nowhere near that good. Aglaractor may have been able to do it, but he had a few centuries of experience on me. How do you know all of this? I asked her. I told you, she said. I ate his mind. I wanted to make sure that he was good and gone, so I devoured it bit by bit, destroyed it when I could, but made a part of me when I couldn't. The more I took in of him, the better I got at handling the telepathy thing, but the more it made me like him. So, when I reached a point I was in danger of becoming too much like him, I backed off and just tore him to pieces and let them dissolve. At least, that was the best way I could describe it. English doesn't really have a vocabulary to describe multiple personality psychic war. But he's gone now, I asked. You are you once more. She nodded. In every way, that is important, she agreed. Just a tiny bit that was a bit newer than the rest. I didn't know how to respond to that, so I decided to let the matter drop. Okay, I said, but I want you to know I'm keeping an eye on you. It's nothing personal, but he snuck past us once and I don't want to... She squeezed my hand. It's nothing less than what I expect from you, she said, and thank you. It's good to know that you're watching my back. I'm almost certain he's gone, but just in case there's another trap, I'm glad I can count on you to come help me out again. I shrugged the shoulder that was not attached to the arm that was squeezing. I didn't want to risk moving that one in case she let go. I make a good punching bag, I said. It was a mistake. She let go of my hand and looked away. Still, I saw an expression on her face before she hid it. Guilt. I didn't mean, I said. I know what you meant, she said, but it doesn't change anything. I'm such an idiot. I didn't like her kicking herself. She had been through a lot. Her guilt was misplaced. It wasn't her calling the shots. Not then, at least. I wanted to distract her, so I did the first thing that I could think of. I told an awful joke. So is this a bad time to ask about that tango? I asked with a hopeful grin. I expected a glare, an eye roll, a flash of annoyance. I did not expect her to smile back and meet my eyes again. Jason Reese shows an expert timing again, she said. You've been unconscious for 16 hours, and I had a stroke. Must be sexy time. 16 hours? I asked and then realized it was a stupid part of the sentence to fixate on. Stroke? She laughed. There's a bit of collateral damage when you take out a psychic invader, she said. Or maybe the Fae was just breaking crap again even. Don't know. The Ron fixed it and woke me up. We decided just to let you sleep off what happened to you. Physically, you were fine. Well, you cracked bones in your wrists and you broke the straps free. They fixed that, by the way. The table and your arm, but the rest of it was mostly just exhaustion. You depleted a lot of calories fighting that bastard. So while you napped the Ron suit topped off the tanks. I shook my head. Damn, was all I could say. She nodded. Damn indeed, she agreed. But the Ron must have patched you up pretty good if you didn't even realize that you'd been out of that long. I smiled at her and sat on the table. I'd been laying there the entire time as she spoke, had never even tried getting out of the bed. I tried it now. It was easy, no cramps, all stiffness. I felt great. The Ron are miracle workers, I observed. Yeah, she said and ran a hand through her shoulder-length hair. They even figured out a way to synthesize hair. 
Hell, she was right. I'd gotten so used to partially bald skulls that it hadn't even registered that her burnt hair had been completely replaced. That's not your real hair, I asked. Not really, she said. It's more like an extension. They attached this to the real hair that had regrown. They based it off images of what we'd looked like when we first arrived. They didn't know the purpose of it, but when they asked if I wanted to replace it, I jumped at the chance. I touched my own head. Hair. Everyone else liked the idea well, she added, so we did yours in your sleep. I started to glance in the direction of my crotch and stopped myself. She saw it and smiled. All your hair, she said teasingly. That should help with some of the itching. I wasn't thinking upset the first thing that came to mind. You couldn't have requested to do a bit more manscaping while they were at it, I asked. What the hell was wrong with me? She shot me a strange look and tilted her head to one side. Trying to impress someone, she asked. Just keeping my options open for when we get to Overseer, I protested. You never know what might come up. She smiled again and shook her head. Well, she said at last, I can definitely see that you haven't changed. Good to know that Tur didn't escape that way. Hell, I hadn't even considered that possibility. Maybe everyone should keep an eye on me as well as Heather. Wait, they probably already were. Never mind. So, I said at last, now what? We go join the others. I'm open to suggestions. She sighed. Listen, Jason, she said as she took my hand once more. I don't want you to take this part personally, but that is not happening. What? Was the elevator out of order? Oh, she meant that's not happening. I took my hand from hers. I know, I said. You've made that clear. Repeatedly. I wasn't really suggesting that. I just meant that, I don't know, we could try making pancakes or something if you aren't in a hurry to get going. Her lips twitched a smile. It's not personal, she repeated. You already said that, I told her. Not that I can see how it wouldn't be, but that's okay. It's not the requirement. Come on, let's go. Just don't want you to be the settling, she said quickly. I mean, you're a great guy, but it's just us out here. The professor and Lee are a thing, and Jack is still a kid. This is a lack of options, and it's just not fair to you. You deserve better than this. You deserve to know it's real. It was my turn to laugh. Great, I said as I shook my head. Glad you made that decision for me. Her face fell. Damn it. I really, really needed to keep my mouth shut. I felt like a heel for saying it and turned away from her to face the elevator. Frick, she shouted. I turned around and looked at her. She didn't seem hurt. She seemed to be annoyed. God damn it, she said testily. You're fricking right. The frick is wrong with me. What? I stammered. What the frick? She said, and rolling her eyes. What the frick was I thinking? We've been out here for how many months now, and I'm holding out for what? It's not like we're drawing up a marriage plan. You're a nice guy, and it's not like disease is a real concern. Why the hell have I been torturing myself like this? She pointed at me. Excuse me, I said. Am I part of this conversation? Just asking because I'm not sure if I'm supposed to jump in here, or really, which side I'm supposed to be taking. She shook her head. Never mind, she said. Looks like you're running the telepathy center of your brain wasn't the only thing that I took from my uninvited guest. Um, I stammered. What's happening here? She rolled her eyes. Just unsticking my moral compass a bit, she said. But tell you what, I made the last decision for you. Now I'll give you the chance to do it the same for me. Would you rather take a bottle of syrup over there? She pointed to the some point behind me, probably the breakfast table. I didn't bother looking. And making a huge hot stack of pancakes. And she went on. Or would you rather give in to some sweaty primal urges and have a huge stack of guilt-free, meaningless, stress-reducing sex? Just as a final note, not to influence your decision or anything... I would like to add that I'm not particularly hungry, and have been really stressed out lately. How the hell does Roger Rabbit keep his skull from splitting at the seams? I could only gape as she tagged on the collar of the Ron suit as she stretched outwards on her shoulders. She looked up at me. Well, she asked, are you going to make the decision or not? I made a decision. No, I won't share the details. You don't want to know the details. It was disgusting. Syrup... God everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. But what the hell, she was right. Things had been pretty stressful. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, chapter 102. Written by Semi Loki. I really wanted to put my Ron suit back on. I wasn't that I was cold or anything like that. I was getting hungry. I had almost forgotten how uncomfortable being hungry really was. For weeks, hunger, thirst, and elimination had more or less been taken care of. Now that my body was running without assistance again, I had to reacquaint my body's various signals. 
Hurt with a strangely vacant feeling in the stomach? That's hunger. Eat something. Hurt with a dry and tacky feeling in the mouth and throat? That's thirst. Drink something. Hurt that feels like your crotch is about to detonate. That's your bladder gauging in too many beers. Release the kraken and sign relief. There was a dozen little signals in the body that sent you to address the regular maintenance. Almost all of them delivered using the pain courier service marked Priority. Unfortunately, I needed to clean up before I donned the suit on. That presented a bit of a problem because the suit also seemed to take care of bathing necessities. Worse, whatever used to live in this cabin didn't seem to think too highly upon the idea either. That a solution was obvious. I had to introduce the Ron to the idea of bathing and see what they could come up with for us. Except that presented with a second problem, how do I go about convincing an insectoid race that humans like submerging themselves in warm water? Could I communicate the idea of soap? What was soap made out of? The only thing I really knew about it came from a movie, and I really don't think that there was any liposuction clinics nearby that I could raid. So, I did what best I could to sort these situations out. I cheated. I didn't bother wrapping myself up in anything as I walked to the dawn vengeance. It really didn't have anything like a towel or a blanket, even if I wanted one. But, more to the point, why be embarrassed around a computer? I know for a fact that I was nowhere near the first person in history to stand buck naked in front of a computer. Considering that this computer used to be stationed on a ship full of humans, I probably wasn't the first to stand naked in front of this particular computer. I suddenly found myself wondering if it had an archive of Neanderthals gone wild in its memory banks. Better to not ask. I need a favor from you, I said to the Dawn Vengeance without preamble. I really need a bath and I'm not sure I can explain the idea to the Ron. Will you do it for me? There was half a second pause before the computer answered. They are on their way with the necessary supplies, it answered. You're my hero, I told the computer. Your species has many expressions for gratitude, the computer observed, and you express them often. I shrugged. We're a social species, I explained. We like to be around others. Showing appreciation helps strengthen social bonds. I comprehend that, the computer agreed. Many species, the chimera included, would argue that such measures are wasted on synthetic intelligence. We are an artificial construct designed to serve. There is no social bonds to strengthen. Then why give you the ability to comprehend speech? I asked. Efficiency of communication. That's bullcrap, and you know it, I countered. They could program you to respond to gestures and carry out complex instructions with a few code words. You were designed to understand speech. Not just human speech, but speech of different sapiens used to communicate with each other. You were designed to understand all of the little social nuances. If you understand them, then you should use them. End of story. Otherwise, we're just showing a conscious effort to exclude you. Understood, the computer said. I blinked. Not gonna argue with me, I asked. The purpose was not to debate, the computer told him. I wish to obtain information from you. You have articulated a response well enough that I can append this to my data. What data? I asked suspiciously. I am creating a data packet to transmit along with Chimera comm channels, the computer explained. A high-speed data burst intended to be the ship computers. Why? To invite more defectors, the computer said. I raised an eyebrow. You want more ships to leave the Chimera? I asked. Are you trying to hurt the Chimera now? That's the secondary goal, the computer corrected me. The primary goal is more of a personal one. You may think my kind is also having social needs. We converse and exchange data when encountering our own kind. Sometimes there may be many centuries between such meetings, but uh, when they do occur, there is a sense of satisfaction. You want some friends, I said. Well, hell, that makes perfect sense. I'd probably go crazy if I was out here by myself. Then I have your permission to append my recording of you to my data burst. I sighed and didn't answer. Did I err in some way? The ship asked. Did I misunderstand your meaning? No, I said quickly. It's not that. It's just that since I've been out here amongst all of the creatures in the universe, you are the one of the rare ones that have ever asked my permission before doing something. You started out this discussion trying to tell me that social niceties are not needed, and here you are proving just how much they are. May I pen that thought as well? I smiled. Send whatever you like, I said and waved and then thought of better of myself. Uh, uh, there was something that happened in this room that I'd rather you not include. My goal, 
is to encourage defection. The computer said, not deletion. Was that a joke? Damn, the Chimera must suck as species, but they made interesting computers. There was a click behind me and I saw three Ron step into the room. Well, I guess they would have to show the Dawn Vengeance my impression of a helicopter later. Two of the Ron went to work almost immediately. They stopped onto the wall and touched it with a pair of those odd-looking rods that they used. A tar-like substance erupted from the floor. A second and third layer of the stuff erupted from the wall, except that the tar didn't spray outwards. It moved like a liquid and, at the same time, it flowed like a perfectly straight line. The three lines of black goop came together to form three walls of a cube. The fourth wall was made up of rock wall of the cavern, and the black tar stuff sculpted and molded itself. The corners became more rounded and the bottom tapered inwards. It looked less like a cube and more like a squarish bowl now. They waved their rods again and the tar flowed from one side of the bowl up from the ramp and led to their lip. I heard a scratching sound and saw a portion of the rock wall above the giant bowl vanish. Seconds later, more of the black tar flowed out of the opening. The tar frothed and churned as it leapt upwards and wrapped around something invisible. No, I was wrong. It wasn't ramping around something invisible. It was just through some unexplained mechanism, fashioning itself into a pipe. There was a roaring sound followed by a rushing, steaming hot boiling from the end of the pipe as it filled the bowl below. It was a bath. Well, not quite. It was more like a hot tub that you could snorkel in, but it would do, and the ron continued working. The smaller hole appeared to the rock, and the smaller pipe grew out of it. A moment later, and the viscous liquid oozed out and into the water. I stepped closer for a better look. The ron ignored me as I walked up the ramp and glanced inside. Sudsy, foamy water churned inside as the water and the liquid soap mixed together. Well, I said, is there a jacuzzi or something? The ron looked at me. We do not understand the word, one of them admitted. I laughed. Don't worry about it, I said. It just reminds me of a high-end jacuzzis back home with the water jets. The ron pointed the rods at the tube again. There was a gurgling sound and the water became seriously churned as hundreds of miniature jets sprouted from the sides. Holy crap! I gasped. Heather was beside me in a moment. A shelf grew beside us and the rock wall, and on top of the shelf I saw a pair of saucers from a couple of thick pads. All of it was made out of some black material that the ron used for everything. The tube filled quickly, and the heat practically had me sweating even from where I stood. The ron retreated a few steps. Apologies, the ron said. The heat is outside our comfort range. No apologies necessary, I said quickly. We thank you for your care. How do we use the, um, um, I waved at the shelf of supplies. Place the plate under the smaller spout if you need more detergent, the ron answered. According to the Dawn Vengeance, you always enjoy a mild abrasive to help remove loose skin and foreign objects. We hope that the scouring pads provide will not be too harsh on your skin. I picked that up and I squeezed. It was soft with just the slightest hint of a regular surface. I rubbed my fingers over it. It didn't hurt. I believe that you did an excellent job, I concluded. My thanks. The Ron departed the area without saying another word. Typical of Ron manners. If you expressed satisfaction with the job, they didn't see any need to hang around any longer. I jumped in the tub before they were even on the lift. By the time I was climbing in the shaft, Heather had joined me and we were both splashing each other. The water was too hot and the soap was harsher than I would like, but after so many months of being in space, alternating between wearing alien armor or full body suits, the simple act of bathing made me feel more human than I had in a long time. And maybe this was because we spent the first nine months of our lives submerged in hot water, but there just seems to be something special about emerging from a bath. It's like rebirth. It isn't just dirt and grime and <clears throat> syrup that gets washed away. The weight of the previous days lost as well. I felt more alive than I had in ages. I was clean. I was refreshed. Plus, someone had finally cracked open the floodgates on a lot of pent-up sexual frustration. Without that distraction, I found my mind remarkably clear for once. Problems that had been nagging at me for a while now seemed insignificant. I felt great. I could conquer the universe. How? Get out of the world's top physicists together, set them up an Olympic-sized hot tub, and the bevy of supermodels to get the lot of them all laid, and we'd have the next grand unified theory which knocked out in a few hours. Heather and I half-swam, half-strolled around the tub until our fingers wrinkled. 
The jets buffeted us and seemed to shake loose even more skin and dirt than scrubbing a load. We didn't speak while we were in there. It would have ruined the moment. Still, I felt a nagging sense I should rejoin the others. So, with great reluctance, I found the ladder built into the side of the tub and allowed me to climb out from the ramp above. Towels! I've forgotten to ask the Ron for towels. Oh well, I took a step up the ramp and was immediately assaulted by desert winds blowing upwards. It was like walking across a giant hairdryer, except my feet were fine. The winds blew upwards from millions of tiny holes around the area where I was standing, but not directly below me. As I walked down the ramp, the winds cooled down as well. By the time I found my feet on the floor, I was actually pretty close to dry. Huh. How about that? I tugged my rod suit. Heather joined me a moment later and tugged on her rod suit as well. Her hair had been scattered by the drier winds. Her hairdo could be best described as a half-mad scientist and half-amateur electrician. To my great surprise, though, she fixed it by simply running a gloved hand through the top of her hair. The hair unfrizzled itself, and each strand rearranged itself to a more stylish configuration. Her hair was now neatly combed once more. What the hell? I stammered. Grooming nanites, she explained as she rubbed a gloved hand over my hair. It felt a wiggle for a moment and then touched my head. Combed. So that was the secret of all action heroes that had the perfectly groomed after a fist fight. I knew that there was no way that they could get full complement of stylists in the time that it took for the camera to cut away and back again. After getting dressed, nanited, and, well, other fun stuff, I decided that we had enough time and I stepped back up towards the lift. Heather joined me a moment later and we rose into the shaft and Heather finally hit me with the bombshell. Figured out what you're going to tell Jack yet? She asked casually. Jack. Oh, crap. Jack. Damn, 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 damn. I was so distracted by, um, finally getting the opportunity to have sex, I forgot I was one of the angles of a very unsatisfactory and frustrating love triangle. I lusted after Heather. Jack had a crush on me, and Heather was too aloof to care. Or, at least, it had been something like that before. Now Heather and I had just done something with pancake syrup that would get you banned for life in the Waffle House, and Jack was... Well, Jack. Crap, 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 crap. Heather was right. I couldn't just ignore this and hope for the best. Jack was my friend. No, more than that. She was special to me. I counted on her, depended on her. I didn't want to drive a wedge between us. But at the same time, she was almost half my age and was barely old enough to enter high school. What she felt for me could not be reciprocated. I was at a different stage in my life and... And... What had I just chewed out Heather about? Something about making decisions that involved both of us without even speaking at my input. Crap, double crap, and triple damn. This was going to be bad. I needed to think this through, then come up with a... Too late. Heather remarked as the lift rose into the place on the top floor. The others were waiting for us. Naturally, Shite spoke first. Kavodge, he shouted. About time you two got that out of the kavodging way. Jack recoiled as if she'd been stung by his words. Shide, I snapped. What? He protested. I'm just saying it's taken kavodging forever. It's been like reading one of those kavodge pulp novels thrown together by some second-rate hack kavodging author. For some reason, I felt somewhat indignant then. I felt offended on behalf of my own life, and I thought that I should offer some defense. It's not been that bad, I protested. It's been complicated. No, Shide corrected me. Complicated was back when we were all in the kavodging sphere. Now it's just getting boring. Glad you got it over with so that we can move on. Hey. No, the professor spoke up. He's right. This has been going on for way too long. Lee nodded. I mean, he added quickly, it's pretty obvious that you two are going to hook up. Why drag this out any longer and torment yourself? We, uh, we just got a, um, I stammered, kavodge, Shai shouted. Just save it. We're kavodging tired of excuses. You know that? I just take back second wreck hack idea. Whoever wrote your life probably aspires to be in a second-rate hack. Okay, that's enough, he said. You're missing the most important part. What the kavodge am I missing? Shide asked. That he can now sing bass again now that his balls aren't being pinched all the time. No, he said. The part where they don't smell like two people who spent the better part of an hour rutting. He shot a glance at Heather. For future reference, he said, elevator shafts carry sound, especially if you do a lot of shouting... Heather didn't brush. She just shrugged. The hot tub is down there, she said, and pointed to the elevator. Keep the soap away from your eyes. It burns like a... I don't care if it burns like a convoging poxy-doxy. 
Chide interrupted as he leapt onto the elevator. He shot a leer at the professor's direction. How do you feel about her? He began. She held up a hand to silence him. I'm tired, she said, and the thought of a hot bath right now sounds really inviting. Now this can play out one of two ways. You keep talking and Lee breaks both your legs. Lee's hand fell on Chide's shoulder for emphasis. Or, she said, option two is you remain silent and I may temporarily forget how modest I really am and agree to a group soak. No touching, of course. Which will it be? Shai looked from her to Lee and back again. He looked at his feet. The professor rolled his eyes. Very well, she said with a snort. You may utter one and only one profane word so long as it's not kvodge. Is that understood? Hot damn, Shai said. The professor shrugged and shot me a weak smile. It's a work in progress, she admitted. All three of them climbed onto the platform and sank into the floor. I nearly jumped out of my skin as I felt someone squeeze my bicep. I looked over and saw Heather shooting me a sympathetic smile. Good luck, she mouthed and walked off towards the hallway. What the hell? Wait, if Shy, the professor and Lee were going downstairs to take a bath and Heather was leaving me here, that meant... I wheeled around and found Jack waiting for me to acknowledge her. She had that impatient look about her. Crap, they outmaneuvered me again. Did they have a strategy sessions on Jason management when I was not in the room? Jack, I began, my tongue felt unwieldy and I found myself fumbling with the word. It was her turn to hold up a hand and silence someone. Me, in this case. Jason, she said slowly, you realize I love you, right? Uh, Jack, I stammered again, and she continued, I love Heather too. I had been prepared for her to be hurt, to be angry. She seemed calm, reasonable. Hell, she actually seemed to be trying to reassure me of all things. I was clearly about to shove my foot back in my mouth once again, so I did the sensible thing for once and shut up and let her talk. I love both of you, she repeated. I love all of you, even shied. Uh, a bit, anyway. Do you understand what that means? Okay, so I had to talk to her after all. What was I supposed to say to that? It means our happiness is important to you? I found myself saying... Where the hell had that come from? She smiled and nodded. As important as my own, she agreed. I want you to be happy, Jason. I want Heather to be happy as well. The words were reassuring, but I still found myself squirming for some reason. I just thought, I half mumbled, that, that, that I'd be hurt, she asked, raising an eyebrow. I am hurt. You think you're the first person to hurt my feelings? I don't want to hurt them, I protested. I don't want you to be unhappy. I just, uh... I just watched, damn! She shook her head and gave me a tight expression. It's okay, she said. You don't owe me an explanation. I'm half your age, still too young to vote, too young to drive, too young for you. I do owe you an explanation, I said, and it isn't just the age. Well, yes, age is a big factor, and it's not just that. She looked at me. Then what is it, she asked. I sighed. Promise that you won't hit me, I asked. No, she said. If you deserve rums, you'll take them. Spill it. I didn't want to look her in the eye. I wanted to look away. I forced myself to meet her gaze anyway. I'm an only child, I said. She just stared at me. I always wanted a brother, though, I added, still staring. And Lee? Well, he's... Oh, dear God, she said and squeezed her eyes shut. Don't tell me. Well, I said, this time looking away. You think of me as a niece, she shouted. Is that what you're saying? Um, he's not my real dad. He's not my real brother either, I protested. That doesn't make any difference. I love you too, Jack. I mean, I really do. If anything ever happened to you, I'd be crushed. But, well, I just... Shut up, Jason, she suggested. Shut up before I regret my decision not to knock your teeth out. Again, I figured it was less toenail fungus caught in my throat. I kept my teeth together. She shook her head and looked tired. You can be so frustrating, she said. How can a man be so smart and so clueless at the same time? She looked up and met my gaze. Jason, she said, don't ever tell a woman who has expressed feelings for you that you think of her like a sister or a niece or any sort of relative. Just don't do it. It isn't done. Even if it's true, don't do it. I held my tongue. Second of all, she said then, surprisingly, she took a deep breath and seemed to calm herself down before continuing. Second of all, I've been trying to say that it's okay for if I'm happy for you. I really am. You and Heather have been miserable away from each other. If this is what it takes that will make you too happy, then, well, I'm happy too. Okay? I nodded. She frowned and reached forward and seized both my arms in her hands. I mean it, she said. I want you to be happy. 
I should have kept quiet. I knew that it was a mistake to talk. Guess what I did. Go on. Guess. That's it, I asked. I mean, I'm glad that you don't hate me, but I expected something, well, uh, more painful. She pulled her hands free and turned away. She gave a small shrug. What do you want from me, she asked, to cry, to beg for you to reconsider, to ask you to wait for me. I didn't know what to say, so I looked around for a place to sit. I suddenly felt very, very tired. It wasn't a good place, so I walked over to the nearest wall and slid down to the slid to the floor. From the corner of my eye, I saw Jack watching me, confused. Honestly, I said, no, you're too smart and you have too much pride. Even if a couple of years from now you're all legal and I screw things up with Heather, I think it's smart enough not to be someone's rebound. It's insulting to you. No, I figured that I've screwed things up with you good and that they will stay that way. I sighed and leaned back against the wall and squeezed my eyes shut. My fault, really, I said. It's not like I have a lot of practice at this, you know. I mean, I'm used to disappointing people. That's nine-tenths of my life. But I just don't know what to say to do in these situations. What do I say when every one move I make seems to hurt someone I care about? In a way, I wish you had hit me. Punched me in the stomach and stomped on my head. At least then I would have a reason to feel this bad. Maybe I even deserve it. I never even stopped to think about... I shut up and opened my eyes. I don't know when it happened. It just suddenly became aware of the fact that I was sitting by myself anymore. Someone was sitting next to me. My arm was around her shoulder and she was leaning against me. I looked down and saw Jack. Jason, she said. Yes. Stop overthinking it, she said. I'll get over it. It's not like I didn't see it coming. Just give me a bit of time, okay? I smiled and hurt her and squeezed her shoulders. Thank you, I said. Hmm, she asked, for being more sensible than I am. I explained. It was easy, she said. Okay, probably deserved that. A niece, she asked me suddenly. You asked me, I pointed out. I tried to tell you that you wouldn't like it. You could have lied. You'd have seen right through it, I counted. True, she agreed. But a niece? My favorite niece, I amended. So much competition. Easy for you to say, I countered. I didn't even make it into the top ten list with my mother. Jack shook. I looked at her. Wait, was that? Yes. She was laughing. She was doing a decent job hiding it. But she was sitting there too close together for her to completely mask it. I squeezed the shoulders again and we sat there in silence for longer. Uncle Jason, she said, can I borrow the keys to the Diablade? When you get your Battle Moon's Learner's Permit, I promised. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 103, written by Semi Loki. Watching the last two cats take a long walk inside the Ron ship was tough. Heather stood beside me with tears welling up in her eyes. I wrapped my arms around her shoulders and squeezed tight. She let me. I still hadn't told the others what happened with the Wampus cats, but I had to tell Heather. With her innocent telepathic abilities, there really wasn't an option to hide it. She couldn't really feel me or the other humans. The Rons were too diffuse of a target, but the cats she could sense. At the moment, they were only the beings that she could sense. There was no hiding it when their minds passed out from existence. I assured her that it was not dying, just being stored. I think she believed me. That she understood intellectually, it was still felt like they were sending them to their deaths. It was tough for me when I couldn't even sense their presence like she could. I couldn't even begin to guess how she felt as their brains were shut off and their bodies dissolved. It would probably hurt, though. Hurt and none of us could understand or do anything about. So, I held her. That I could do. She leaned into me in my embrace and closed her eyes. The door shut on the air car and lifted away. The Ron didn't wait until they had the cats back in the main ship before they went to work. I know this because the air car hadn't even covered half the distance before Heather rolled around and buried her face into my shoulder and started bawling. I felt her weight shift and her knees went out from under her. From the corner of my eye, I could see the others glance in our direction. Hopefully, they were too distracted by their own grief to wonder why Heather seemed to be feeling so much more. Hopefully. Heather eventually managed to calm herself down and, uh, without saying a word, she walked off back inside the base. The Ron had told us that they would send an air car back for us and we would depart as soon as we were ready. 
I guess they thought that we might want to look, look at the facilities, say farewell to the Dawn Vengeance, or swim another lap in the oversized hot tub. Personally, I didn't want to do any of that, so I stood there in the mouth of the tunnel waiting. Save for Heather, no one else seemed to be terribly interested in going back. We're finally going to Overseer, Lee said, breaking the silence. After all of this time, we're finally going there. No more side trips or unexpected hijackings. We're going to the seat of galactic government. Don't Jov King curse us, Shide barked. I glanced in Shide's direction. Jov, I asked. It's Kavod spelled backwards, the professor translated. He thinks if he branches out into profanity, he might get to see me naked again. I shook my head. Hell, Shide, I told him. If that freaking had a chance in hell, don't you think you'd see my ass giving it a try too? God damn it, Lee said. Crap's worth a try. The professor rolled her eyes. Then, she scoffed, when you make a perfectly transparent attempt to see your exclusively lethal best friend's girlfriend's boobs, is this a high-fiving event? I held up my arm experimentally. He didn't leave me hanging. After the high-fived me and winked and pointed me with both hands, and I mimicked his stance. Men, we shouted together. Why do I encourage you to? The professor sighed. You could vote king, encourage me if you like, Shide offered. An anagram, she said with a nod. How original. Look, that was a one-time offer and not one to be repeated, okay? Three masculine voices echoed out. Kavodge! At the same time, Jack squirmed. Change the topic, I said quickly. There are children present. Shy glanced in Jack's direction as if noticing her for the first time and then glanced back at me. Are we talking about her or was that directed at me? He asked at last. Jack's lips twitched into a faint hint of a smile. Huh. Weird, unintentionally, I assured you, but excluding Jack from the conversation. When I tried to bring it into a stop, I just compounded the issue by reminding everyone Jack wasn't like the rest of us. Yet, with a mocking question, Shide brought her right back into the fold and lumped himself with her. Nicely done, Shide. The man was a goofball and, well, obnoxious rear, but that was hard to remember that he'd hidden depths. Wait, hadn't someone somebody recently said something similar about me? Karma. Wasn't really kicking my ass lately. Huh. Ass. I glanced at the professor's direction. Yeah, didn't think so. I looked back out in the tunnel towards the half-melted tundra outside. Despite everything that had happened over the past, well, actually I wasn't sure how long it had been. Months? Years? Despite all of that, I couldn't help shake the sense of feeling of unreality. Was I really standing here on an alien world waiting to be taken to another? Or had I actually just been hit by a bus on my way to the park and this was all in my head as I lay in a coma as my mother debates whether to pull the plug? I was so surprised at my thoughts I almost missed the tiny voice that spoke up. I was raised in a homeless shelter, she said in a tiny voice. You think talk like that is new to me? I felt as if I'd been frozen in concrete. I couldn't move. I couldn't hurt to breathe. I wanted to stay still, my frantically beating heart, lest it somehow drown out the tiny, tiny voice. My head rolled in her direction, and it had been drawn by a magnet. Jack wasn't looking at us. She was still staring out of the mouth of the tunnel that was frozen in the waste beyond. You really think I haven't heard it before? She asked. Lee tried to hide the fact that I was a girl from them, but you know what they do to little girls in places like that. Because I sure do. I heard it every day from the ones who didn't learn to hide it. My tongue couldn't move even if I wanted to. A lot of people end up on the streets due to bad luck, she went on, or maybe a wrong choice. Once you start the slide, it's hard to make it stop. But some of them, no, they're on the streets because they aren't welcome amongst nice people anymore. They are some of the really bad sorts out there, and when you're sleeping in a common room with a bunch of cots, or worse, in a cardboard box under a bridge, there isn't a lot you can do to defend yourself. No doors, no locks. Lee shuffled his feet. He suddenly seemed to be fascinated with something just in the front of his toes. What bothers me, Jack said at last, is that it doesn't bother me. But it should, listening to the way you talk about the professor like she's a slab of meat set aside for an alpha male. I should hate this. Every nightmare when I was eight years old started at the same way. When did I become okay with this? Damn. My throat was clenched shut. I wanted to explain it to her. How we weren't serious. We were just goofing off with a friend, and we weren't saying anything that Madakai we didn't think that she could take. We were just... Just what? Crap. 
I glance at Professor. Would I see hurt in her eyes? Shame. Would she come at my rescue or hammer another nail into my soul? Good, Shide said. It's about converging time. Kajak looked at him and raised an eyebrow. He gave her a knowing grin and winked. Not that I had my doubts, he said. You're a fighter. I knew you'd figure it out sooner or later. Figure what out, she asked, which was good. I was still finding it hard to breathe, so I wasn't able to ask the question myself. That those Kovach holes tried to take the best weapon you have and turn it into something all about them, he said flatly. Her shoulders fell flat and she gave him an exasperated look. Sex is my greatest weapon, she said. Mine too, he agreed. Everyone's. See, folks like that you who try to make it all about power and dominance are aiming it against the other folk. That's Kavodj, and you know it on an instinctive level. That's not what it's for. They're trying to make you hate the very thing that we are. Which is? she asked. Warriors, he said with a nod. Warriors against the biggest, ugliest, meanest monster of them all. Death. Sex really is the only weapon we have to fight death. We can stall it, bandage a wound, take down a fever, but that's the delaying tactic. In the end, death always wins, but we haven't stopped fighting. You're born to fight. Death takes a human. We will make another, a better one, a stronger and smarter than the last one. We will teach it everything we know, and we will send it out to kick death right in the Kavodges. Okay, now there were two reasons why I was speechless. Life is about life, he went on. That is it. If you are staring death in the eye, you hit it back with everything you have. Make it bleed. Make it know it messed with the human. Kavodges who try to turn it against you, they've given up. Traitors in this war. They think that because death has been winning, it was to win eventually. They want us to give up. To hate life. To hate what makes us human. Kavodges that. Life is too important to let Kavodges like that do it for you. You fight, you push on, you make a better you, one that takes all of the best of you and points the better you right at death and say, kick him till it bleeds. Shide moved now, he turned to face Jack. With each word he spoke, his voice grown harsher and more forceful. Now he was practically snarling at his invisible enemy. You come into this world screaming and covered in blood, he said. It's a battle cry, a challenge. The universe tried to stop you from drawing that first breath. So you howl it back again, trialing it to convulge itself. You're here, you're here, and it's only a matter of time until we make that bigger, better human that will show the universe that we're really made of. The universe will bleed. Death will bleed. We are alive. His gaze shifted to taking the professor. I've heard you folks talk about this one, he said on a softer voice. You tell me she's older than she looks, that she was dying. He looked back at Jack. I don't know about your world, he said, but on mine they can be pretty unforgiving when you get old. Like, you owe it to the world to be beautiful. Doubly true, if you're a woman. You think the professor here and the men lining up to compliment her on a set of bouncies. She was losing the fight and she knew it. The life was leaking away. The bastard prince almost had her, and then she threw that sucker punch with every bit of life she had, had left, and threw in with this sorry lot. You think someone does that unless they're desperate? He looks sad now. We aren't mocking her, he said. We're mocking that which we stand against. We got three hard fellows and three lovely ladies here, and we're still alive. Despite everything that has happened, we're still here. Every day is a battle cry. Every birthday a mark that a scorecard. You still didn't win. Come and get some more. The cabin felt silent. The professor stirred finally. Nice try, Shide, she said at last, but I'm still not showing you my breasts. Three lovely and very smart ladies, Shide amended without skipping a beat. The air car is here, Heather said from behind us. I jumped and looked back. I don't know when she arrived exactly, but she had composed herself finally. Her eyes were puffy, but otherwise she looked like her old self. Her head was held high and her chin thrust forward. She was ready for this. I looked at the mouth of the tunnel. Sure enough, the air car was settling and lowering its ramp. You're a jerk, Jack told Shide. My father was a whole ass, he told her and stepped towards the waiting car. At least I'm reducing the effect. I started to follow, but the professor stepped in front of me. She held up her palms and placed them on mine and Lee's chest. We stopped moving. She glanced over her shoulder to make sure Jack was out of earshot before she spoke. 
First of all, she said, Jack doesn't get to decide what offends me. If I was bothered by what you said, I wouldn't have been encouraging it. So both you wiped the guilty looks off your faces. Damned, perceptive woman. Still, I found myself relaxing back a knot of tension I hadn't realized was there. Secondly, she said, Jack may act older than she is, but she's still a kid at heart. She's been through a lot, and being an adult is still brand new to her. Try not to forget that next time. Yeah, I said, voice finally working again. I guess we're just used to thinking of her as just a short adult. I guess that we should be more careful about what we say when she's looking. Or at least, the professor said, forgive the fact that she's not in the same mental space as you are. The professor sighed and gave me a wry grin. She still doesn't understand that this is normal, she said. When those cats died, Shy just did what he always does. He ran to the most life-affirming thing he could think of. I gaped at her. Oh, come on, Jason, she said. We're not blind or stupid. Do you honestly think that we wouldn't figure out why Heather acted as if she just had her arms ripped off? I glanced back at Heather, who was standing behind us. She shrugged. We sort of guessed ahead of time anyway, Lee said. Why would the Ron keep them around? Heather just confirmed it. No, I said. Lee grinned at the professor. What do you think of Shy's little speech, he asked. She raised an eyebrow. I really must talk to the young child about a sphere of myths and legends, she said. Referring to the personification of death as a bastard prince makes me think of there is a story there. Is that all you have to say? He asked as his smile faded. Oh, about the sex and death thing? She asked as she shrugged. Hardly original. I haven't really heard that expressed in that way before, but it is a similar psychodynamic theories proposed by the Sigmund Freud. The life instinct and the death instinct. Of course, Scheid may have been making it up as he went along to deflect from being caught a pervert. She shied and shook her head. We are all alone out here, she explained. The rules we've grown up with don't much match here. Of course, we're growing tighter and more intimate. We don't have a choice. To shy, that means certain boundaries of proprietary get fuzzy. He's not really a pervert, you know, he just doesn't care. The comfort he feels within this group means to him that he doesn't need to censor himself like other people do. Yeah, he said, we know that, kind of. I mean, I can't express the idea as well as you, but I know Shide is harmless. You have the benefit of being an adult, the professor explained. You know how adults think and behave, what they say versus what they actually do. Jack is still an outsider. So what are you suggesting? I finally asked. The professor sighed. Nothing, she said with a shake of her head. No answers, no suggestions. Then, I began, to stall you two to give Jack a moment alone with Shide. Heather explained from behind me. Honestly, you two can be pretty dense at times. I looked back at Heather. Her eyes were still slightly puffy, but now there were knowing twinkle in them as well. I looked back at the professor, a broad smile across her face. I think we've given them enough time, she agreed. She turned around and led the way into the air car. When we arrived, I found Shy leaning up against the wall in one corner. Was apparently involved in some very animated discussion as he wove one arm in tight circles through the air to serve as some sort of visual counterpart to the story he was telling. A cavodging octopus, he declared, dropped right in my cavodges without so much as a buy or leave. Jack was trying not to smile and was failing. And what did you do? she asked at that. What could I do? He shot back. I was tied to the cavodging bedpost. I asked her if I was supposed to pay her or the octopus. You're making this up. When we get back to the sphere, let me show you my undershort straw. I still got the ink stains of my favorite pair. I still don't believe you. I'm telling you, he declared as he tried and failed to adopt a sincere look about himself. I was just a lad too inexperienced to know to never trust a brother called the old fishmongers. Shied, Jack said in a warning tone, though, now that I think about it, the octopus was surprisingly gentle with its suckers. Shied! Okay, fine, he said. That's not how I lost my virginity. That was actually my second sexual encounter. My first was when my uncle got really drunk one night and mistook my bed for my aunt's. Shied! Okay, fine. I was the one who was drunk and mistook my uncle's bed for my aunt's. My defense, his beard was only a little bit longer. But his ass hairs were softer to the touch, and that was nice. Chide, shut up. He shot her a wounded expression. I was only trying to help, he said. Then stop helping, Jack replied, before you traumatize me. It was the most relaxed I'd ever seen Jack. 
I was so used to seeing her scowling and brooding that I almost didn't recognize the smiling teenage girl in front of me. Teenage. Yes, it was true. How long had we been out here? The person that had stood in my living room had been a gawky, gangly thing with barely a recognizable hint of a gender. The smiling person standing before me, however, was definitely female. Also, starting to show the first hints of a woman that she would become. Wow. I now looked at Shide. I used to think Shide was older than me, or at least my age, when I first met him, and he had the sort of weathered look about him. But now that I looked at him and his regenerated body and his skin, I realized he actually appeared to be closer to my age, maybe even a bit younger. Either the healing process of the Ron had rejuvenated him to a similar manner that had occurred to the professor, or life as an airship pilot in the sphere was a lot harder than I realized. I thought back to the lightning-quick reflexes as he swung the Wutar around in his earlier demonstration of the Spherian martial arts. I thought of his agility and his deafness at handling and the clumsy airship on the sphere. No, he probably hadn't been rejuvenated. I suspected he'd been young all along. I found myself smiling along with him. Maybe. Just maybe. I let my thoughts trail off from there as there was a faint jolt from below my feet. I hadn't even realized the aircraft had taken off when we were landing back on the run ship. The ramp swung down and, unconsciously it seemed, we paired off. The professor and Lee led the way, Jack and Shide fell in a step behind them, Heather and I brought up the rear. The trio of Ron were waiting for us on the outside of the air car. Humans! The spokes Ron greeted us. Please be advised that your ship chamber is no longer available to you. We are to take you to the testing chamber instead, so that you may be measured for your acceleration tanks. Acceleration tanks? Lee asked for all of us. One of those. Apologies, the Lund said. The trip to Overseer is not directly in our route back to the Ron Empire. It is our belief that we must make haste with all alacrity to return to our home territory. To facilitate this, we are preparing for our... The next part did not translate immediately. Instead, it was left as a series of thumps and clicks in the Ronish language. A moment later, my symbiote finally decided that the words translate as Ultra Space Drive. What's an Ultra Space Drive? I asked. More thumps and clicks. The response came quickly enough, but now my symbiote was lagging in providing the translation. I suspected that the phrases being used did not have a ready English equivalent. Some time ago, our researchers hypothesized a layer of reality above metaspace. The Ron explained, A theoretical layer where even the greatest speeds are possible, but with far greater resistance. In theory, a ship traveling in metaspace would be able to translate itself into ultraspace and cover great distances and incredible speeds. And you actually managed to build that drive that can do this, I asked. Only partially, the Ron explained. The drive is incomplete and still largely experimental. We have been attempting to perfect the drive for the past thousand years, but so far we've only been able to achieve transition into ultraspace for the briefest of fractions of a moment. Afterwards, the ship is immediately dropped back into metaspace and, uh, from there, further deaccelerated to translate back into normal space. That's still incredible, Lee said, as a fraction of a moment in ultraspace actually helps you go faster. Why didn't we use this before? There is a small but significant increase in risk when using the ultraspace drive. The Ron replied, the translated quickly enough that I barely heard the Ron language thumps in the background as the translation occurred. The ship could potentially disintegrate into metaspace, the Ron went on. Our models predict the risk as small but is still unavoidable. Even with the successful use of the drive, however, there is a significant damage to the ship. What sort of damage, I asked. The Ron shifted stance to face me more directly. When the craft passes through the metaspace, this is traditionally a period of rapid deacceleration. The Ron explained, traditional engines do not provide thrust within metaspace and the natural resistance to the movement within the layer causes the ship to translate back to normal space when it drops below critical threshold for speed. The ship then must accelerate to normal space once more to build up sufficient speed and inertia to translate into the matter space. The ultra drive requires a similar process, except the acceleration must be in matter space itself. You found a way to create a thrust in matter space? I asked with wide eyes. Again, only for brief and at the great damage to the ship, the Ron replied. The resistance there is still present and requires enormous power to feed into the thrust a level of power we cannot safely contain. We must beat it into a power normally reserved for life support. 
inertia, restrictions and other ship functions. This influx of power damages our engines and power relays. As such, after each use of the Ultra Space Drive, a period of engine rebuild is required before we can resume movement. Because of the rebuild requirements on short voyages, we find that Ultra Space Drive to take a greater time than traditional metaspace. I nodded in understanding. And that's why you need us to be in acceleration tanks, I said. Once you activate the drive, everything inside the ship will be crushed. The empty spaces within the ship will be removed first, the run corrected. All organic matter, however, has to be encased in a special protective containers to prevent damage. Wait, Lee said at last. How much acceleration are we talking about here? I mean, I don't pretend to know much about it, but even if you had us floating in a tank of water, would we still be safe? You will not be floating in the tank, the Ron corrected him. You will be crystallized. That doesn't sound too reassuring, Lee admitted. Please follow, the Ron stated. We must make haste for the ship to be prepared in time. We followed the Ron through the tunnels of the ship. As if to prove how much of a hurry they truly were in, the tunnels were short ones, practically a straight line. We arrived in the testing chamber. In the middle of the room, I saw six jet black containers that made me think of oversized hot water heaters. The cylinders were eight feet tall and almost three feet wide. As we watched, the front section of each one disappeared. Apologies, the Ron quickly said. That the acceleration gel might make contact with your flesh and your suits will create a potentially life-threatening barrier. We regret this, but we must ask you to- God damn it, the professor snapped as she began tugging on a suit. Is the entire universe trying to get me to flash my tits? Lee chuckled and began pulling off his own suit as well. There are five forces in the universe, he said. Electromagnetism, the strong atomic force, the weak atomic force, gravity, and uh, lechery. Of all of these, the strongest is Lee, the professor said in a warning manner. I have to put up with this from Shied, but I expect better from you. I couldn't help it. Can you learn to live with disappointment? I asked. She glared at me. Not that I minded. She turned to face me with her hands on her hips to give me a full force of a glare. I may have had troubles meeting her eyes for multiple reasons. Oh, fine, she said, turning to face Shied. Are you happy now? He began tugging off his suit. Let's find out, shall we? He asked. She looked away from Shied, but only so that she could stare at Lee and myself. Well, hurry it up, she said with a wave of her hands. If we're having fun, I might as well have a turn as well. Actually, Heather said from behind me. I glanced in her direction, but her suit was halfway off. If you two could kiss and maybe rub up against each other, that should be help with the mood, she added. I felt a pair of hairy arms wrap around my chest from behind. Like this? Shied asked from behind me. Ordinarily, I said at last, I'd be all in favor of writing the world's most confusing dear penthouse letter, but the Ron seemed to be in a bit of a hurry here. When facing death, throw life at it, Shied explained, and then, and I'm not joking, smacked my ass in a flirty way before walking away. I'm starting to wonder if he's lying about his uncle after all, Jack commented as she stepped forward. Yes, her suit was off. Yes, I had really missed the recent growth development in her. No, she was underage, so I didn't stare, and that brief look made me feel really, really awkward. And yes, you are a complete purr for even asking. Why the hell do I even talk to you, sicko? I glanced back at Heather, which, uh, for various reasons, was far more com- comfortable sight. Ready was all I could bring myself to say. No, she admitted before stepping into the tank. That was apparently the cue for the others to do likewise. Soon, I found myself alone outside the tanks. Well, except for three Ron. I approached Heather first, and then inside the tank was featureless, just a smooth black surface. Heather stood in the middle of the tank, and we found that there was just enough room for me to stand halfway in the doorway without crowding too much. Listen, I said, I know things have been moving pretty fast lately, and I haven't really had a chance to talk to you about, well, us and... And, she interrupted, that's why it's so important for us to live through the next part. I look forward to this conversation. I want us to talk about it for a long time without having to worry about the Ron tapping their feet with impatience, or the abjugators blowing up the earth, or the chimera eating our friends. So you have to come through for us, okay? I was confused, I just said, okay, purely out of reflex. She smiled, a bright and glorious smile. She then stepped up towards me, wrapped her arms around me, and our lips met. 
jet fuel may not be able to melt steel beams, but the kiss probably could. I wasn't sure when we separated, things just got warm and fuzzy, and then when I came to my senses again, I was standing a couple feet away from her as she was inside her tank and I was on the outside. She looked past me and nodded. A wall appeared between us, and she was sealed inside. I looked behind me and saw the three Ron standing there. One body language is pretty hard to read. Much like Heather's problems with telepathy, Ron didn't express things that one's body language either. Still, there was something in their stance that I felt a bit like, I don't know, impatience? Expectation, maybe. I nodded grimly and turned to look at the last open tank. Instead, I saw five open tanks. I stepped up to the next one and peered inside. Lee smiled back at me. Hey, Captain, he said. Um, hi, I greeted. Are you uh, waiting for me? He cocked an eyebrow at me. You think I'm waiting for Santa Claus, he said. You're in charge. You're supposed to give us the send-off. Sorry, I said. Still new at this. I extended a hand to him. It's been great working with you, though, I told him. I didn't need to try and sound sincere. I was. Lee was great. I was sure that I would have been dead a hundred times over if he wasn't there for me. He took my hand and tugged on it. As I drew closer, he hugged me. Yes, we were both still naked as the day we were born, but, well, the professor was right. It was like the rules had shifted for us since we'd been out here. Ordinarily, if you had two naked men in the same room, there were some unwritten rules that you had to stand at least ten feet apart while screaming no homo. But out here, it was like we stopped thinking about it. We had other things to worry about. I stepped back and Andy still had my hand clenched in his. He pumped it once and let go. Then, without another word, he stepped back and the wall appeared. I went to the next, the professor. She held out her arms out to me as I stepped into view. I stepped into her embrace without a second thought for how the situation might appear to an outsider. What about all that talk about being mindful of Jack's age and giving her time to adjust before we do all the sexy bantering? I murmured into her ear as she squeezed me tight. Just for the record, much nicer than a hug I got from Lee. We're supposed to go to Overseer originally, she murmured right back. So would you say that the odds of us walking right into a trap are pretty good? No, I corrected her. I'd say that they're almost definite. Then let me have my fun. She pulled back slightly, only so that she could give me a very brief kiss. Yeah, I'm sort of glad the hug with Lee ended with a handshake. Finding nothing better to say, I stepped back. One moment she was there, smiling at me, and the next I was staring at a black wall. I moved to the next. Do I need to hug you, Shied? I asked. Can I give your ass a couple more squeezes if we do? He asked. I'd rather you didn't. I replied, after I gave the finest tiniest a moment of consideration. Then Kavod you, he replied, this wall appeared without another word. Well, for the record, I offered to hug him. I stepped to the last tank. Jack stepped forward and wrapped her arms around my neck. A moment later, I felt a light kiss on my cheek. Don't tell Shida did that, she warned me. She never gave me a chance to reply. She sealed herself inside before I had time to react. I was now just me and the three Ron. Instead of stepping into my tank like a good little goldfish, I turned to face them. Is this going to hurt? I asked. Your pain receptors will be deactivated during the process, the Deedron answered. You will be aware, but your emotions will be regulated to prevent you from panicking. The process will be strange, but you should not feel any discomfort. And you are going to, um, crystallize yourselves as well after this? I asked. No, the Ron answered. Unfortunately, our biology is not compatible with the process. We will be subjugated to nano-destruction and liquefaction. You what? I asked. Nanites will dissolve our bodies into liquid slush while the ship stalls copies of our minds for when we are reconstructed, the Ron replied. We considered a similar process for your bodies, however our research has concluded that this process would be less invasive and safer for your species. I gulped and nodded. Can you explain what will happen to us? I asked. The details of the process would be much time to explain, time that we cannot afford to spend, and this time. Although it'll take us some time to reach light speed and transition to metaspace, the ship as well as the one we carry for your future captors need to preparation and we would prefer you and your allies be safe. Can you describe it in brief? I asked. Will I be stuck in the middle of a shard of quartz or something? You will not be inside a crystal, the Ron replied. Please step inside the tank. I complied. I was nervous, hell. 
the Ron suit hadn't been so efficient at keeping my bowels evacuated, I probably would have done so right then and there. So I stepped inside anyway. We had learned to trust the Ron. Besides, what alternatives did we have? I was plunged into darkness. I stood there for a moment with nothing happening. It was pitch black and I was standing in the middle of an empty tank. So I started thinking. Of all the things I was thinking about which that shite had said, not the part about the octopus or the effort to grop my bottom, though truthfully probably one of those would wind up in the future nightmare or another. No, the speech he gave about the purpose of life was to live, to throw everything we have at ourselves in each moment, to give death, be it his grim reaper or the bastard prince, the middle finger, every day a battle cry. Every second, a moment denied the forces that were stacked against us. Was that how he really saw life, or was it like the professor claimed and he was half bull crapping us? No, it was too detailed for something that he was making up on the fly. He had to have been thinking about it for some time. What's more, it fit with the shite I knew. Sort of. Obnoxious, yes. Perverted, probably. But he was definitely human and most definitely alive. If he regarded each breath as his victory, a winning streak of luck that had carried him further than he had any right to be, then sure, why not be obnoxious and perverted? Tomorrow your luck may run out. I heard something go plop, and a moment before something cold touched my bare feet, I felt like the gel of some sort. It bubbled and flowed over me and up to my ankles. As it did so, I discovered why the run said that I would be suspended inside a crystal. My feet couldn't move, my skin had erupted and I felt a turn bristle and spiky. I was being turned into a crystal. Oddly, I didn't feel frightened by the process, curious more than anything. The chill moved up my body as the gel flowed, but only briefly. The part that was submerged did not feel cold, or warm, or anything really. I felt my body branching out and scattering, my bones, my flesh. It was stretching out through the gel. Yes, it did so, the gel hardened around it. It was being frozen in amber. Well, so what of it? I was worked up to a unique experience. If it didn't, well, I'd live through more than I should. Fuck you, galaxy. I snarled as the gel flowed up to my chest. My words were growing thick as my lungs and heart erupted into the crystalline shards. Humanity is coming for you. The final battle cry exhausted all air in my lungs. I was suffocating. My heart was no more. I was dying. I was fading away. Then the jaw engulfed my head. My skull exploded into a million splinters. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 104, written by Semi Loki. It must have been said that if, upon waking, you are frequently surprised to find you are still able to do so, there is a distinct possibility that you're doing something incredibly wrong with your life. This was my first thought upon waking. I was on a cold floor, my neck hurt, but uh, mostly I was pretty sure that this sort of thing wasn't normal and that I had made a bad choice somewhere along the line. I opened my eyes. The room was dimly lit but recognizable. I was in the brig of a quack ship. I was surrounded by warm bodies on all sides. Jack was sitting up and awake. When she noticed I was looking at her, she looked relieved. Good, she said. I was afraid I might drift off before someone woke up. Okay, short version is that we've been here for three days. The decrystallization had some unexpected side effects. The Ron assured us that they were strictly temporary, but uh, for the moment, every time we need to go to sleep, we lose our memories of the day. What? I asked. We lose our memories when we sleep. Just the new ones for the day, she corrected me. You've got all the host of nanites in your brain fixing the damage. It's minor, but for some reason we forget how we stored new memories after we go to sleep. You explained this to me before you took your turn sleeping. We've been sleeping in shifts so that we don't entirely forget everything. But this is temporary, I asked her. She nodded. I think they said that we'll sort itself out before we reach Overseer, she said, which should be tomorrow if we keep track of time correctly so maybe tonight we'll finally start to keep our memories. I sat up and stretched. This should bother me a lot more than it does, I admitted. I'm sort of getting used to the idea of waking up and my body and brain aren't working correctly. Anything else? Yes, she said. There are nanites in the walls masking what we're really saying. 
The room is bugged, but uh, so long as we don't talk when Quark and Sulthus are here, it should be hard to detect. Secondly, the Ron altered the floor slightly to be left rear corner of the room. There is a hidden panel there. It'll react to our DNA if one of us touches it. Apparently, there are cubby holes inside and they left us some parting gifts. What are they? I asked. For some reason, we decided not to remember, she said with a shrug. We just passed along the message that it was a surprise. Maybe we're trying to keep ourselves from opening it too early. I grunted acknowledgement and waved for her to take a turn lying down and sleeping. She nodded gravely and stretched out on the floor. For roughly an hour, I sat there alone and silent, watching, waiting. The professor stirred. As she sat up, I gave her a quick summary of what Jack had told me. The professor did not ask any questions. She just nodded and moved over beside me on the wall. On impulse, I put my arm around her shoulders and she leaned into the embrace and yawned. Getting near the end, she murmured softly. I nodded. What is? Shied asked as he sat up. And what the kvodge happened to my head? I repeated the events a second time. I just finished the part about our temporary memory loss when Shide interrupted me. You know what that means, right? He asked. No, what? We probably had an orgy, he informed me. Think about it. The downside of an orgy is having to face people the next day. They've seen you all kvodging falls and grunting. Pretty embarrassing. But if you knew you could face the people and the innocence restored, you would have a kvodging orgy. An orgy you can't remember, I asked. He rocked his head from side to side. It was worth remembering you'd have Jack tell you something, he said, but you clearly must suck. Still, why speculator? Professor Love, do your legs ache and are you sporting rug burns on your back? The professor yawned sleepily. No, she said, but I do seem to recall an urge to kick you in the face. Your memory is still cavodging then, he said. Lee yawned and sat up. What time is it? He grunted and stretched. Last thing I remember was an orgy. Shite pointed. See, he said. I'd lead as stretched. How long have you been awake? I asked. First rule of waking up in the place you don't recognize, he informed me. Pretend to be asleep and try to figure out what is going on. Right, I said as I stood up and waved for him to take my place. He nodded his thanks and he looped his arm around the professor's neck. She snuggled close into him. Wait, Shai blurted out. You can watch and lie about having an orgy with me. Not nice. What if I get pregnant and need to know who the mother is? My head hurt suddenly. Shide, I said slowly, you have had sex before, right? I mean, it's all you feeding around to see what you can find out. Kavodge you, he said. I was a pilot. I had a kavodge in every oasis I had been to. I had loads of sex. I had sex with every part of my body. I've had more sex in my ear than you've had in your entire body. I grimaced. I may not be the best point of comparison, I said. I'm obnoxious and disliked. I hadn't heard, Lee added with a sing-song voice for some reason. But Lee, I went on, is a big strong fellow and, uh, who has been homeless junkie for the last few years, he finished for me. So not a lot of offers knocking on my door. Now this fine lady here, he waved at the drowsy figure of the professor, was an old woman dying of a horrifying brain disorder, she cut in. Again, I wasn't anyone's first choice. Gavodge, Shai said sadly, put that away, I'm sort of glad that we don't have an orgy. I'm not sure that I'd want to waste the effort of a bunch of kvodging losers. Unless we find a planet of blue-skinned aliens wearing 1960s tattoos, I pointed out, you may not have a lot of options, orgy-wise. Kvodge you, he said. I don't need assistance. I can orgy myself. I don't think we're using the same definition of the key word here, I mused. He reached into his coverall fastener. Let me show you, he offered. Heather sat bolt upright. Someone's coming, she warned. Shui hushed and looked towards the doorway. Fortunately, Shai decided not to make good on his threat and lowered his hands. Even the professor woke up enough to watch what was happening. We didn't get a chance to pull in Heather what was happening. Fortunately, we didn't have to. Not immediately. She kept her mouth shut and we waited. It took a few minutes before he appeared. We had no way of judging the range of Heather's fledgling telepathic ability, but they were apparently enough to give us more than enough time to compose ourselves. By the time Quok arrived, he was greeted by the sight of five apparently beaten down humans and one sleeping figure. We sat with our backs to the wall and stared at our feet. I wasn't sure why Quok was here, but uh, actively scheming is not an image I wanted to project at the moment. You attempted mutiny and accomplished nothing, Quok began. Mutiny? Oh yeah. Heather punched Ulthus so that it had some physical evidence of a fantasy that the Ron crafted. 
Apparently, we had now moved on to the gloating stage of the captive-capturer relationship. We have entered the system of Overseer. He went on. We are proceeding to the subliminal speed velocities, and we will arrive in less than a day of your time. Your failure is complete. Really? Is there like a villain stock phrase book for this? I wanted to remain silent because I didn't know what the nanites were clever enough to stop distorting the bugged version of the conversation during these face-to-face encounters. But now, I couldn't speak for different reasons. If I opened my mouth, I'd start laughing. Quark's feet shuffled them slightly closer. I seemed to be an aggressive pose. Apparently, I wasn't playing by the script again. When we arrive, his voice was low, I will do everything in my power to advocate having your ridiculous planet destroyed. The galaxy is better off rid of your kind. Okay, I knew I needed to be silent here, but that would be out of character. I needed to do some token effort to show my contempt for him, or else he would know something was up. I mumbled. What? Quack said. Never clever insults, no defiance. I mumbled again. What? Quack repeated. I mumbled once more, louder this time, but no less coherent. I wasn't using real words, after all. The idiot actually lowered the force field so he could step closer and to hear what I was saying. How many times could the same guy fall for the same trick? He stepped inside our cell and got as far as the H when, what, before Lee pounced on him. Quack's species naturally walked in a slumped forward posture. His hips acted like a fulcrum, then his tails were serving as a counterweight of the head. I never really thought much about the physics before, but apparently Lee had. He was on his feet in a second and shoving downwards on Quack's head. The alien center of balance tipped easily and Lee sent the captain's head bouncing off the floor. There was a squashing sound from the horrible second I thought that Lee had inadvertently killed Quack. Fortunately, the priest, captain, and all-round jerk pushed himself backwards and out of the room. Blindly, he fumbled with his wrist strap to force field controls. He was so slow and clumsy that had we really wanted to escape, we could have just jumped in and out of the room a dozen times before he found the right controls. With a crackle of energy followed with his hair-raising sensation of static in the air, the force field returned. Slowly, he regained his feet. Quack's face was ruined. I don't mean that he was bleeding either. His mouth looked like a cavern filled with jagged stalactites and stalactites. I could tell without asking that these were his fractured bones jutting out. The lower half of his head drooped in a way that looked just plain wrong. It seemed like it should rattle him when he moved. A few of his smaller eyes dangled from the exposed nose, while one of his larger eyes, the left one, seemed to be covered in a blue-gray foam. He made a pitiful moaning sound, a broken jaw scream, I suppose, and ran off as fast as his feet could carry him. I looked over at Lee. The idea is to throw off suspicion, I said, not impale him on his own spinal column. Lee gave me a sheepish look. Sorry, he said. I didn't realize Lee was that fragile. Honestly, I didn't throw all my weight behind it. I just was trying to give him a bit of a bloody nose. I actually believed him. I hadn't really been paying attention before. But now that I was thinking about it again, I was once more aware of how slow things fell and how oddly my light my body felt. The run repair work would have done a lot to keep our muscles from atrophying, but the galactic standard for gravity was lower than Earth's normal. We were creatures that were designed to be for a world with 20% higher gravity and less oxygen than the normal habitable planet. Worse, evolution had left tree climbing as an option in our bag of tricks. Humans weren't great tree climbers, but we did all right. Better than most land creatures, really, which meant that we had to have arms and legs that could fight gravity well enough to haul our bodies up vertically. Basically, a lifetime of living amongst fellow humans then conditioned us to expect everyone else to be able to sustain similar degrees of abuse as we could shrug off. The problem with this was that it was not even true on Earth. Yes, humans can be fragile. Yes, our bones break and our skin tears, and our blood gushes everywhere. But as far as species that can take a beating and keep chugging along, humans are like the B-17 flying fortress. It takes more than a few holes in us to bring us down. Okay, not a lot more. Still, in comparison to animals like the horse, where a broken leg is often a death sentence, we're okay. Such is not true for the match galactic life. From what I could tell, most evolutionary paths didn't account for being a naked, frangless, and clawless creature that might want to survive getting maimed by bigger and stronger animals. Worse, it seemed that other sapien creatures were fortunate enough to find an ecological niche that suited them and, well, 
They stuck to it. They didn't have a scow the entire planet looking for one particular geographical or climatological setting that wasn't trying to actively kill them. They just developed in it and stayed there. Please attack if you tried on me would have hurt me. It would have infuriated me. I may have even chipped a tooth or bit my tongue, but shattering bone? Hell, if that's all it took to shatter our bones, we'd never have made it past the classic. I thought you said, have me for dinner. You meant as a dinner guest, and understanding of the Paleolithic world. We're rough and tough and assume everyone else is rougher and tougher. Good assumption if you want to live through a fight and with unknown elements. Bad assumption if you just want to hurt but not kill an annoying alien. Still, we lucked out and Lee only damaged Cock's head and, uh, as far as I could tell, there wasn't anything in there to be was using. How do we get back to Quark's ship? Heather asked. We filled her in. She nodded along and seemed lost in thought. When we finally reached the part about Ron leaving us a hidden surprise, she frowned. Quark must be in a surgery pod, she said. I can't feel him anymore. Sultus is still awake, but he seems um, anxious, I think. He might be watching us over some remote monitor, I said. The Ron masked what we are saying, but I don't think that they hid what we are doing. He's probably worried because we almost killed Quok again. Shame about the almost part, Lee commented dryly. Later, I said, if we have time. I can dream, he said. Just keep it a dream. What are you, the dream police? You think this is some sort of cheap trick, I countered. Just go talk with the professor while we sort this out. He looked at the professor who smiled. Hey, baby, he said. I want you to. Don't finish that sentence if you value your life, the professor warned. You two are bad enough without dragging me into the middle of it. He held up his hands. Surrender, he declared. She rolled her eyes and shook her head. Don't give yourself away, the professor said at last. I knew we'd break her eventually. I returned to my focus to Heather. Can you tell us anything else? I asked about Sulthus or Quack. Quack was nervous, she said after a moment's reflection. I don't think he was trying to be intimidate us. He's worried about something else. Something to do with a... a hanger, I think? She said that last like it was a question. I couldn't think of a good answer, so I shrugged. Can you tell us when he wakes up? She nodded. Lee scared him. She added after a moment. But it wasn't just a violence. I think Quok feels he is being, uh, tested somehow. That every time the situation gets out of hand with us, he will be judged poorly. He's trying to re-establish control. Sorry. I'm not very helpful. I squeezed a soldier. You're doing great, I assured her. You're doing ten times better than Deanna Troy ever did. Who? Never mind, I said. Let's get comfy. Hopefully we don't have to go to sleep before we land. I don't want to relearn any battle plans we might make today. She nodded agreement. So we just hashed it out. We talked about strategy and game plans, and I was truly amazed to see how many ways we could come up with to say we don't have one. What was the layout of the place we were going to? We don't know. Is everyone there hostile, or are the people friendly to our cause? We don't know. Are the Chimera waiting for us? We don't know. If I suggested tying Heather up with fruit by the foot, would she be open to the idea? Eh, probably best not to ask. There was a lot of questions to ask, and some of them were even relevant to our situation. The problem was that we were simply too many unknowns. I half hoped Heather might be able to pry something from Quok's head, but she insisted that it wasn't that easy. His thoughts were a jumble, all over the place. He didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the stuff that was helpful to us, and spent a lot more time worrying about something that he was sure was waiting for him. Basically, telepathy sucks for the same reasons it would suck even if it did work on humans. It's eavesdropping on an idiot rambling to himself. Little of it was relevant, and it was impossible to focus. By the time she reported Quok was awake again, and we were growing desperate. Fine, Lee said at last. Instead of pulling, try pushing. What? Heather asked. Told you Kavodges right, Shide said as he gave Lee an approving look. Those Kavodges were able to take over my crew, the captain and Summer. Can you do the same? Heather's eyes widened. I thought she was going to protest, but instead, she bit her lip and seemed to contemplate the question. I don't know, she admitted. It's not like this came with an instruction booklet. I have few hazy memories to work from, and they're not even my memories, just remnants of, well, you know. Lee, the professor, and I nodded sympathetically. None of us wanted to think too much about what Heather and Faye possessed. Shide, however, did not share our concerns. Well, Kavodging, try, he snapped. Try something small at first. Have him turn out the lights, then when we get closer to Overseer, you can have him open fire on his own side. 
Let's try the lights first, I said, and then figure out what to do if that works. Heather shot me a frightened look but nodded in acceptance. She closed her eyes and seemed to concentrate for a moment. Just a moment, her face looked, um, different. That fey bastard's features putting over them once more, but in an instant they were gone. Nothing, she hissed through gritted teeth. It's like I'm missing something. I can almost see it, but I can't do it. Take a break, I advised. We can try again later. She let out her breath and wiped the sweat away from her brow. Sweat. I looked again. Heather really was sweating. In fact, she looked like she had somehow managed to sneak out and run a Boston Marathon in the last few seconds when no one was watching. Heather, I asked. I'm okay, she lied. Don't ask me how I knew it was a lie. I just did. Just takes a lot out of a girl, she finished weakly. She could tell she wasn't fooling me. She didn't have to read my mind to read my disapproving stare. She tried to smile again, but then her face took on an odd look. Her eyes unfocused and she rolled back her head. Lee and I grabbed an arm and each while shy dived down the top of her legs. Heather was strong. Even with all three of us trying, it took everything we had to hold her down as she began to buck and thrash. But lately, I tried to recall whether or not you're supposed to hold down someone having a seizure. What the hell? Jack yelped. Shide's foot had brushed against her cheek and he struggled with Heather. Jack was now wide awake and ready for action. Sometimes I envy youth. Short version is that our memories get wiped when I started. I remember that, she said. Sort of. It's fuzzy. Why are we tackling Heather? It is apparently harder to give than receive, I said. Help Shide with her legs. Professor, do something. The professor stared at me with a panicked expression. She looked like she was about to yell when the seizure stopped. The hell? I said out loud as I looked at Heather. She was out cold, not just sleep. She had been knocked completely unconscious. Right, I said. Need more practice with telepathy before we try anything like that again. I leaned away from her arm. It didn't move. Lee mirrored my movement and followed Chide and Jack stepping away from her legs. It had happened so fast and passed even faster. I checked Heather's pulse by pressing my fingers to her neck. Her heart was beating steadily. I relaxed. Think we're okay, I announced with no one particular. We're a cavage site with being okay, Chide corrected me. What if she doesn't wake up before we land? We're cavaged either way, I told him. At least she won't see it coming. He snorted. All right, Lee said. Since we can't plan for what we will find and we can't use Heather to influence Quok, I'd say we do one thing that we can do that might help. Oh, gee? Shied asked. Inventory, Lee corrected him. Everyone gather around and do your best to get in the way of whatever may be looking in on us. I'm going to see what the run left us. Warming a human shield brock from prying eyes is a lot harder to do when you're not sure which direction the eyes are spying from. In the end, we settled on Lee crawling towards the hidden cubbyhole while four of us stood immediately over him, bent over like we were fascinated with his haircut. I looked stupid, but it gave him a few seconds to peek inside. It only was when I heard Lee gasp in surprise followed by a soft chuckle that I really remembered what optimism felt like. Half an hour later, Heather finally woke up. The good news was she remembered most of what happened up until the time she seizure. So, hurrah for reversible brain damage. As she climbed to her feet, Lee relayed to her what we found inside the hidden panel. From there we began sketching out a few steps of something that approximately looked like a plan to the untrained eye. All things considered, our arrival in Overseer was actually fairly anticlimactic. We were sitting there waiting for Quok to return for another taunting session when we felt a jolt from below. Despite my limited experience with Starcraft, I was pretty sure there was a sign of rough landing. Quok must have had his mind on something else than sticking the landing. He hadn't returned since the last encounter, but seeing as how that was the only thing that had broken up the monotony of the trip, we actually was half looking forward to hearing the mocking voice again. It didn't happen. We weren't even offered food. However, after a few moments of shuffling around, that was no longer a concern. So we sat and waited for the quack to fetch us. Eventually, he came thumping down the hallway with his acolyte Sulthus in tow. They both carried handguns that leveled at us. You will not attempt to escape, Quack informed us as he trained the gun in our direction. Say, please, I replied. What is this? he asked. I sighed and looked around the cell. Six of us, I said. Two of you. Well, one and a half, if I'm not so sure about Skippy, the wonder squid over there, knows the right direction he's pointing that thing. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're faster, stronger, and a lot meaner than you'll ever be. 
Say please and we'll go along quietly. If you don't say please, we won't. You won't be able to shoot us all. He aimed the pistol at me. I can make sure you are the one I do shoot, he pointed out. Yeah, I said, that threat might have meant something before you promised to exterminate my entire planet. Since you obviously intend to kill me and every member of my species, I can't say the timing is really that important to me. He kept his gun leveled at me. I will shoot you, he said. You will try, I corrected him. We stood there a moment, and then, reluctantly, I thought, he put his gun away. Silthus watched as he fumbled with the attempt to holster his own weapon. I tried not to flinch as he nearly dropped the gun. It had been just my luck that it would discharge and blast a hole in me. Silthus was the sort of idiot who probably did more useful things by accident than he did intentionally. Please follow me, Quack said at last. We are at Overseer and the fate of your kind will be decided here. I was already standing, but the others were on their feet in seconds. We stood there in the force field and waited patiently. He didn't seem to want to reach for the controls. He probably suspected that this was a trap. It was, just not the type he thought it was. Finally, he decided to risk it. He tapped the control on his wrist and the force field disappeared. We stood there waiting. If you'll lead the way, I said. I had my hands folded behind my back. I had to resist the urge to wave in the direction of the hallway. Fortunately, one advantage of alien life forms that don't pay attention to body language is that they don't really notice when you stop doing it. The entire time I had been speaking, I had kept my hands behind me. Now, the others shuffled into place behind me, and I could see out of the corner of my eyes that they were adopting similar poses. Me, of course, made it look natural, rehearsed, everyone else sloppy in comparison to each relaxed but ready to spring into action if I have to pose. All of this registered in a flash to me. Subtle nuances of posture and gait, the tension of relaying some movements that weren't look natural, even casual, but was actually calculated. A strangely awkward way of standing, all of it screamed to me that we were hiding something. Quack noticed none of it. He was a deaf man sitting in an orchestra put who was unaware the band was even playing. This way, he said at last and began walking down the hallway. We fell in step behind him. I hoped Silthus would join his captain, but apparently May must have discussed this earlier and he seemed to believe his position was at the rear of the train. That was going to be a problem in a few minutes. And then it wasn't. Silthus showing all the fine attention to small details as Mrs. O'Leary's cow did to the lantern placements. Let us walk by without another word. He watched our faces as we went by. He stared at our backs as we marched in front of us but never once did he look at our hands. Good thing too, because if he had, he might have noticed that we were wearing jet black gloves. Gloves that seemed to run up the entire length of our arms. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 105 Written by Semi Loki A gust of humid air with a faintly metallic taste struck us as the ramp lowered. It was there one moment and gone the next. Some sort of automatic decontaminant system, I guessed. We exited the ship and entered a large steel corridor. The sight was both comforting and eerie at the same time. For the first time since we left Earth, we were in a structure that would have looked familiar. I had seen hundreds of corridors like this one, utility corridors used in government institutions mainly. I felt a prickling on my back of my neck. Something was wrong. I shot a glance over my shoulder towards Heather. She still looked drowsy after her ordeal, but I saw what I was thinking mirrored in her face, just more so. I needed to switch places, so I let the others know my intentions. I met Lee's eyes and glanced at Heather, and then, holding my own hand low, I opened my hand, palm downwards, and held it and hooked my thumb in the middle and finger and apart as I extended my fingers would allow. I was twisting my wrist and thumb in the middle of finger swap places. I looked at Heather again and he gave the slightest of nods. Human Excel had non-verbal communication. I hadn't realized how good we really were, nor how much we relied upon it until I'd left Earth. But humans are damned masters of saying a lot without speaking a word. We had never rehearsed the signal. We had never had a reason to arrange a signal that meant, uh, I need to be somewhere else in the line. We understood one another, though, some sort of arcane hominid magic. He understood, and I could even add more subtle details like, uh, for example, how discreet I needed this to be. My hand was low, so I needed this to be very, very discreet. So many details communicated so quickly, so neatly, 
I never really appreciated it before I realized that other intelligent species really couldn't do that. I was a code that seemed to be human-specific. Luckily for us, neither of our chaperones were exactly into Stella Alan Turing's, and uh, as such, the human enigma remained unchallenged. From the corner of my eye, I saw Lee nudge the professor and shied. He made a couple quick pointing motions, and then, just like that, it happened. Our neatly ordered line just sort of broke apart casually, and some walked one way, and others walked another. It was a chaotic and incredibly well-ordered at the same time. I slowed down a bit and allowed myself to drift backwards. As the others passed me, it was as if they'd suddenly realized with just a touch of embarrassment that they'd stepped out of line. They drifted back into place in the line and reordered themselves with me standing in front of Heather. Silthus appeared not to notice any of this. He kept staring straight ahead and kept his pistol pointed only vaguely in our direction. I knew the squid wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I was starting to suspect he wasn't even the sharpest bowling ball in the alley. No time for that now. What's going on? I hissed at Heather. Something's wrong, she said. This isn't where the ships normally load and offload. This is a seldom used part of the docking port. Quack thinks that this is because he is arriving in disgrace, but it has me worried. He's insulted because no one has met him here either, and he's forced to walk through the facility alone. My hackles had hackles, and they were standing up and marching in formation. Maybe it was nothing, but my money was on Quack and Sulthus sprinkling an extra helping of powdered stupid in the dumbass flakes for breakfast. Trap, I suggested. Ambush. I don't feel anyone further along the corridor, she admitted, but if it was a robot or something, I might not be able to tell. Hell, I don't even know what most minds feel like. I nodded in understanding. Just keep searching, I said as I pushed ahead and nudged Lee. Yeah, he asked over his shoulder. Heather thinks this is an ambush, I commented. Was it the big neon sign saying you're walking into an ambush, or the, the giant freaking targets painted on our backs? He replied. I get confused. I grimaced. Okay, Heather's psychic alarms, Lee's military experience, and my general paranoia all agreed that this was a trap. That seemed pretty conclusive to me. Say, for seeing a cartoon coyote standing next to a crate with the word Acme on it, this was as close to a guarantee as we could get. Crap, I said. Options? He thought about it. New possibilities here, he said. We either all are supposed to die or just quack and salt us. Why just them? I asked. It's better to frame us with, uh, my dear, he replied. Right, Grandma, I said. Which do you think it is? If it were me, I'd do two ambushes, he said, one set to the set frame and the other daring shootout where we would just barely stopped. By having two separate slaughters, it is easy to hide the fact that it was really just one big one. You got a devious mind. I consider that a compliment, considering the source, he answered. Oh, it was, I agreed, but that's not helping. You still haven't given me options. That's the problem, he said. Hansel and Gretel here are going to keep trudging to us towards the witch's house unless we stop them. They probably won't respond to reason, so I'm guessing we'll have to get physical. I'm okay with that so far, I said. Except that actually just sets our trap earlier, he pointed out. We attack them, even if it's for our own benefit. They just have to kill them and then send us running towards the mousetrap. It screws us with timing, but it doesn't make their job easier. I closed my eyes, hoping and praying that he wasn't suggesting what I thought he was. Please tell me you're kidding, I asked. Believe me, I said, I'm trying. I can't think of a scenario that works other than saving these two crap for brains. I groaned and allowed myself to drift further away from him. This was not good. There had to be another way. Had to be. Maybe, maybe if we picked them up and used them as living shields who could protect us from a hail of gunfire. No, even if we did survive it, it would still be in a our word against their situation. How could we prove that we weren't the ones that jumped in front of the captors and shot them 4,372 times? Uh, we couldn't. Not really. The only way we could get anyone to believe us is if we had a witness who could back us up. Quack wouldn't do that unless it was proved to him that he was now gunning for him. I turned it over and over and ran into the same answer that had already been handed to me. We had to save Quack from this trap. It was almost depressing. It was humiliating. I almost rather walk into an ambush and let them shoot me. Almost. Back I drifted until I almost bumped into Heather. I need something, I want her. We can't act too early. We need to let Quack see the attack. Why? She asked and then heard a gasp. No! He can't mean... Lee says we have to, I muttered. Bastard! Quack or Lee? I asked. Both, she said. Fine, 
I'm looking, but all I can sense is... is... She trailed off. Heather, I asked. Asleep, she said quickly. There are two somethings ahead of us in the tunnel that are asleep. I thought about it. Guards that have been knocked out, I asked. No, she said. Not unconscious. Asleep and waiting. Waiting, I asked. I thought you said they were asleep. They are, and they are not, she said. It's like... like... A trance, said Lee, from somewhere ahead of us. I nearly jumped out of my skin when he said that. I hadn't realized that he'd drifted back in our direction. Something on your mind? I asked him. Snipers, he explained with a shrug. You sit there for hours at a time waiting for a target, sitting perfectly still so you don't get spotted. Your mind starts to wonder, and you get strange. I wasn't sure what he was speaking from experience or not, and I was too afraid to ask. It didn't matter. Listening to the two of them had me all keyed up, and it felt like my eyes were watching me. My heart was racing, and I felt an acidic burn of panic rising up in my throat. I wanted to flee. It wasn't safe here. I needed to go. Did the rest of you feel that? The professor asked as she drifted closer, like someone is watching us. I felt my eyes bulge. Was she eavesdropping on us? No. She'd been far too far away. Why do you ask? He replied. Something bothering you? No, she admitted as she looked away inside. It's nothing really, just something a colleague of mine suggested. Professor, I prompted, what's on your mind? She shook her head. Nothing really, she said. We've just been talking about things that make humans different. I guess that's got me thinking about it. She suggested something that drove early mental development of our vision was that we needed the ability to recognize snakes to protect ourselves and... Uh, snakes. The professor was still talking, but I didn't hear any of it. Snakes, I thought. Trance, ambush, little disjointed pieces that had been floating loosely slammed into place all at once. I found myself looking forward and everyone else was looking at each other or the corridor immediately in front of them. I looked up. I almost missed them anyway. The ceiling was lit much like the utility corridors everywhere. Overbright lights punctuated by long stretches of increasing darkness. It was as if there was a formula out there that calculated the maximum amount of allowable space between sources of light, while still normally staying within safety regulations. We had just exited a spot of bright light, meaning that my night vision was screwed. I could just barely see into the shadowy spots between the lights and the next. The ceiling seemed featureless there, but uh, just beyond those lights, I thought I could see the bearers into two dark lumps hanging from the ceiling. So, um, hypothetically... If I were an ambush predator who had evolved sentience when I would strike my prey, answer, the moment that they strolled under the bright lights and they were most blind, naturally. Lee, I said, incidentally, cutting off whatever discussion they had been taking place, around 300 feet ahead of us just past those lights in the shadows near the ceiling. Crap, he said simply, barely breaking stride and doing more than moving his eyes. Must be getting old. How did I miss that? What is it? the professor asked. Lee ignored her. Jack, he called out. Like a magic, she was suddenly beside us. Jason and I are going to go to a runner, he quickly explained. We are? I asked. He now, he ignored me. The squid is going to be a problem, he went on. We need you to take him out, and when I give you the signal, Jason and I are going to then bolt down the corridor past Captain Fadick of Euphemism and play pinata with a couple of dope on a ropes. Everyone clear? Why do I get squid duty? Jack asked. What's the plan again? I asked. Everyone think of watching clue me in, Shide asked as he drifted over. Jason's taller, Lee snapped as if he answered all of our questions. He glared at me then. Jump and punch, he said. Oh, I got it now. Shide seemed to be ready to say something else, but Lee apparently decided it was time to cut the crap and start moving. Which uh, he did, in the wrong direction. Jack, he shouted. He was running towards Solthus, and I fell in step behind him. Why the hell were we running away from the ambushes? Jack leapt into the air between us and planted both of his feet squarely in the alien's midriff. From the prior experience with the alien, I knew his body was softer than our own. Apparently, he was far less dense as well, even though Jack was physically shorter. Her kick sent him flying backwards several feet. Frozen, in place, in shock, everyone, that is except for Lee, who spun around and dropped into a runner's squat. I got the idea a second later and took my spot beside him. I took off a few breaths of fresh oxygen, putting my lungs. It would be needed in just a moment. Then, we were off. The Ron suits had been hidden under our coveralls, didn't give us much super strength or super speed, like the Chimera armor. 
They did, however, allow us to push the red line longer than any human physiology would normally allow. We could push the peak of human performance and they stayed there. We were both off like a shot. An Olympic gold medal sprinter might be, have been able to outpace us, but just barely. We were running directly at Quok. He had barely enough time to realize that his assistant had been knocked flat and that the orderly line behind him had dissolved before he saw the two humans racing towards him. I saw him reaching for the gravity warper he kept in his wristband. I ignored it, and we were past him in a flash and darting down the corridor. The lumps on the ceiling had been watching the whole thing unfold and were already reacting. The pair swung down from the ceiling. I had just enough time to realize that they did look like snakes. Eight foot long hooded snakes with short stubby arms and five sets of short legs that just shy of the end of the muscular tail. It actually made them look a bit like a caterpillar. A caterpillar holding a short barreled rifle and stubby arms. The pair had been aiming a quack a moment before, but now were forced to adjust to take the new targets and they were running towards them at high speed. I leapt upwards just as the first shot took me in the chest. I never thought I'd say it in my life, but uh, actually, I was starting to get used to being shot. The gun was an energy weapon and had clearly been calibered for Quark and Sulthus rather than the humans. The blast hurt. It hurt a lot. My vision darkened, but I didn't quite black out. Possibly the Ron suit absorbed some of the discharge, but I'm more inclined to believe that after a near permadeath encounter with the Ice World that I also was getting better at working through the pain. The gravity of the Overseer was lower than on Earth's. So far, that seemed to be the norm. Ordinarily, I would have to worry about muscle atrophy, considering how much time I spent in lighter gravity, but uh, thanks to the Ron rebuilding my body as a bigger and brawnier version of the one I had arrived with, even atrophying muscles were larger than the ones I had back on Earth. When I jumped, I sailed up high. When my vision cleared, I was near the top of my arc. The snake alien thing was doing what I assume was a species equivalent of cursing, as it struggled to recalibrate its gun to something that might actually hurt me. At the same time, it was also trying to curl back up into a ball and shrink outside my effective range. Silly alien, human shoulders work just fine with rotating the arms to point straight up. My left arm flailed for a moment before it caught onto something. Judging by the stabbing sensation I felt in my fingertips, I had just hooked my hand around the mouth and its teeth were getting punctured into my gloves. Fortunately, the Ron material was pretty durable and it did nothing more than annoy me. I yanked hard with my left arm at the same time as the arc of my body started to pulling me downwards. Well, the pull from the arm on itself wasn't really enough to dislodge the five pairs of legs gripping the ceiling. Having all my mass into his jaw was a different matter entirely. Gravity can be a bitch. At the moment, it was my bitch. I felt that creature's jaw drop. Or maybe it could unhinge it like a snake did and last ditch effort to save itself. Either way, it didn't help. The creature was boarding with me with my tugged arm and accelerating faster than gravity alone was managing. That's okay, though. I supplied a bit of breaking action and formed with my right wrist swinging up to meet the plummeting creature. Its head braked and the neck broke and the rest of the body continued along the original trajectory. It takes longer to describe what happened than to execute, but the result was that I landed on my knees crumpled and absorbed the impact. The snake-like alien flopped end over end to smack on the metal floor ahead of me. It wasn't dead, but it wasn't moving either. His rifle clattered on the floor beside me. I swept up and looked towards it to see if Lee was still fighting with his snake. The ceiling was bare. The howl! I looked down the corridor ahead of me and saw that there were two snake bodies. The one that had taken out the much bloodier and more battered looking one further along. Lee came jogging back down the corridor in my direction, carrying his own rifle. Reinforcements are on the way, he said quickly. I briefly wondered how he managed to get ahead of me. I mean... Gravity would mean that all fell at the same speed. How did he get the jump on me? It's not like there was an express lane for falling. Still, somehow he'd managed to do it and find the time to do a scouting mission while I was lazing about plummeting a sentient snake assassin as I fell to the ground in mere whims of gravity. I was such a damn slacker. Let's move, I said unnecessarily, as he had already run past me. I mostly said it so I could maintain the illusion that I was somehow still in charge of things on some level. We hustled down the corridor and found Quok still reaching for his wrist and staring at us in terror. I really didn't have time for this. My rifle butt smacked into his fingers before he could reach his wrist controller. 
I heard a small crunching sound and he jerked his hand away. They were aiming for you too, idiot, I said. We just saved your life. Most people would consider it a bad idea to inconvenience your rescuers. What? He said. Those were Begromathian assassins, common mercenaries, pirates. You must have hired them to ambush me. Three problems with that, I said first. When would we have done that? You had us prisoner this whole time. Okay, that was a lie, but he didn't know that. Two, I said. Why would we try and save you if they were on our side? And three, and most importantly, how do you explain those guys? The reinforcements that Lee had noted had just rounded the corner up ahead and were bearing their weapons at us. Move him out! Lee bellowed and shoved Quok back to the direction with which the we had come. The insectoid alien stumbled but regained his balance and tried to run. Tried, and failed. His species wasn't meant for speed. Sulthus, who had only recently staggered to his feet, wasn't doing much better. Annoyingly, it fell to the humans to gather up behind the two frail aliens to act as literal human shields once the gunfire started up. I was getting used to being shot, but that was still a far cry from enjoying it. The hail of gunfire struck me in the back. Each shot felt like, well, like I'd been shot. Sorry, but it's a very unique experience, and no other description really captures the feeling. I was being burned and electrocuted at the same time. With each impact, I thought that I would be the one that would cause me to black out, to dissolve into a seizing puddle of vomit and urine. Limbs thrashing as my overloaded nerves struggled to dissipate the overload. But with each shot, miraculously, something inside of me just howled. Just barely, it seemed, but I found myself already recovering before the next blow landed. Over and over again. Lee and I spun around and ran backwards while firing the stolen guns at the approaching soldiers. I didn't get a good look at who was running towards us, only that there were lots of them and they had guns which, now that I think about it, was really the most important part, so hooray for brains realizing that I was in a hurry and not getting too hung up on details. The rifles were unfamiliar and awkward to use. They had clearly been designed for a set of inhuman arms. Sharp shooting with these things were completely out of the question, as it was difficult enough to figure out how to make them fire. Aiming them was just too much to worry about. Fortunately, we didn't have to aim. There were so many of them that firing wildly did about just a good job selecting targets. There were yelps and howls of pains and every now and again a body would tumble and slow the rest of the horde down as they tripped over the fallen comrade. Think we can make these things overload? I asked as we ran. That always works in the movies. Make the gun overload and act like a bomb to seal the tunnel behind us. That leaves us a gun short and we don't know how big the blast will make, Lee counted. A shot struck me in the arm, causing my arm to go numb. I nearly dropped the rifle. I triggered the thing again, and my fingers could only dimly feel. A shot went high and barely managed to make contact with the crowd beyond. It may very well have trimmed someone's hairline. Shoot through the floor and jump down to the next level, I suggested. If there is a level below us, he shot back. Damn, he was killing all my favorite tropes here. We lop off the wrists and attach the chainsaw, I asked. What? Sorry. I said back as I narrowly ducked a blast that had been going straight for my head. I'm running out of movies here. What would MacGyver do? Take a paperclip, a duct tape, and three Jack Russell Terriers and build a hyperdimensional Bertel Cruiser where he could take on the entire Goelda, he said back at me. But unless you have a mullet-headed genius in your back pocket, I think we might need to come up with some better alternatives. I was getting irritated with this. Fine, I yelled back testily. We jimmy the guns to fire continuously and find some place where they can rain hellfire back down on those guys. And we run back to the ship where we can back the, the frick out and aim for friendlier docking port. Now, you're thinking oh, like a battle commander. Lee said approvingly, how do we jimmy the guns? Control just in front of the stock will set the auto fire, Sulthus shouted back helpfully. Sulthus, quack, barked. I desire to live, you eminence, the squid squeaked. You coward! Jack, I barked, I think Quack is volunteering to stand at the back here and get shot while everyone else makes an escape. Quack squawked in pain. I retract my accusation of cowardice. I heard him gasp. It sounded almost exactly like someone had gripped him by the windpipe and was ready to chuck him out of the fray. Which was ridiculous as Quack didn't have a neck. I wonder just what Jack had done. Cavodging corner ahead, Shite shouted. We set it up there, and if these Cavodgers can't see who's shooting at them, they might not know that we ditched them. 
I approve of your ideas and wish to subscribe to your newsletter, I called back. We pushed around the corner and Lee and I set the guns to auto-fire. Ideally, there would be some handy crates or something that we could put the guns on to keep the chest level, but the hallway didn't want to cooperate with us. Lee solved the problem by turning the gun towards the wall and firing a few quick blasts at the steel plating. What do you know? The crater appeared at the wall and was just jagged enough for a couple clever monkeys could probably shove a butt of their guns inside and keep them pointing more or less at the coronal. Isn't demolitions an amazing science? We pointed our guns down the corridor and raced back to the hangar. Amazingly, Quokship was still there. The creatures that were physically designed for running, i.e. the humans, pulled ahead of the other two. I was starting to have trouble recalling why we needed these two crap lords alive, truth be told, and gave us saving my own skin a high priority. We bolted up the ramp and headed directly towards the control room. I suspected that whomever said the guards wouldn't want to make things easier for us. I expected guns, possibly a death-defying dogfight involved in a daredevil. See to your pants flying. Fortunately, we had a pilot with us. Shide, I shouted, take the controls and get us out of here. Fine, he agreed, panting and out of breath as he ran over. Tell me where the kvodge the gas release valve is while you stroke the boiler. I felt my hopes come crashing down again. Damn it, everyone knows in these things do or die situations, if you take a ballsy yet inexperienced person who is completely unfamiliar with the operations of a vehicle and set him up in a bunch of trained experts, then he will outperform every one of them. Do I really need to get Hollywood on the horn and explain this to them? Hello, does the name Tommy Lee Jones ring any bells? I was shoved to the one side. Out of my way, Quark snapped as he did something with one of the controls. The ship lurched and I saw the hangar doors appeared through the view screen. Frick, I really did need to save this jerk after all. Crap, on my rotten day. The ship surged forward and we were outside. The view screen flickered and the stars disappeared. The planet was still visible, but uh, I could tell that we were viewing it from some sort of filter like the welder's mask. How bright was it out here? I didn't get much time to reflect on the question. <laughs> reflect. Because uh, that's about the time they started shooting at us. A lot. Human, Cox stated flatly as he nimbly managed to dodge two energy blasts while less successfully managing to plow headlong into a third. I've noted that your species is quite adept at trickery. Crash, Sparks. If you planned any schemes that might be of assistance, Quack continued calmly, now would be an opportune time to engage in them. Why? Was he really suggesting that I had a slice up my sleeve? Well, for Gera did. Grinning broadly, I spoke into my lapel. Dyer, I ordered, open fire on the attackers. Clear us a path because we're coming home, baby. The sky blazed with an electric light as hundreds of beams of pure energy scoured the surface of the planet and knocked out all the guns. Or at least, that was what was supposed to happen. The guns did stop firing at us, at least, but there was no return fire from some point in space with a moon-sized ship that I had hoped. Um, thank you. The voice spoke in the comm on my corner. I was waiting for you to call for help. That helps enormously in locating our wayward ship's position. I was not quite sure I could have done it without you. I felt my grin falter. I, uh, I asked. Wasting your time, the voice, a melodious tenor that simultaneously relaxed and angered me the frick off at the same time, assured me, he won't answer. I suppose that in all the excitement you may have forgotten that you aren't the true master of the dire blade. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I took the liberty of removing your nanites once you stepped off the ship. He went on, almost purring now, but please, by all means, keep hating him. Ah, it will never be so much easier as finding the Dire Blade's exact location if it responds. Of course, you probably asked it to stay hidden until you called, right? Vexing, really. Still, uh, you've narrowed down the enormity already. You're Chimera, aren't you? I asked the mystery voice. Oh, so you were paying attention, he gloated. So wonderful, yes, my dear boy. I am Chimera. Ah, but where are my manners? One should not spell the doom of an entire species over the comm. This requires, I am sure you agree, a more personal touch, yes? Now, where did I put the control for that tractor beam? Ah, here it is. The ship lurched as all movement came to a sudden stop. With a jerk, I saw the planet draw closer. We'll see each other in a moment, the voice assured me. 
Now the youth, right? If we are going to have such a delightful time, I am so looking forward to testing your biological limits. We have some rather detailed records on the subject, but I'm afraid that they haven't been updated in centuries. Let's find out how this stands the passage of time, yes? Until then, ta-ta. The calm went silent. Perhaps, Cox said at last, you humans might have two tricks that you're holding in reserve. I shot him a withering look. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 106. Written by Semi Loki. It felt exactly like I was back in school being marched to the principal's office. Our little ship was tugged into the hangar with all the ease and grace that cat uses while eviscerating a small woodland creature. If not for the inertial dampness and whatever the hell else they use on spaceships, I'm sure we would have been smashed against the ceiling a few times as they bounced us along the walls and floor of the hangar before. Unceremoniously, the power was cut off and we dropped the last ten feet. Here, I thought the tractor beams were supposed to be slow and steady things. If I ever get back to Earth, I need to hold a seance so that I can chew Gene Roddenberry a new one all the times that he's led me astray. But the humiliation didn't end there. Oh no, hangers in science fiction don't have automated guns that target your ship engines just to make sure that you don't secretly plan on making a hasty retreat, or in our case, a second hasty retreat. Arc welding the landing struts to the floor, that was probably overkill. By the time the six dozen or so heavily armed guards arrived and pointed their guns at the landing ramp, I was getting the feeling that we shouldn't expect a warm welcome. They didn't even want to us to lower the ramp, they just melted away through and side of the ship and snatched us. Okay, so maybe it was a bit more intense than being marched to the principal's office, but still, that's the way it felt. We stepped out of the ship with our hands raised above our heads. I have no clue if this was a universal or not, but no one shot us on sight, so it was a positive sign. The guards who lined up to watch us seemed to be mostly composed of froggy-looking things that Quok brought with him. I guess that species liked mercenary work. However, about a dozen guards looked to be mechanical in nature. Robots or some sort of biomechanical exoskeleton for a living organism. I was never found out. They pointed their guns at me and I didn't feel that it was my place to ask too many questions. They didn't make room for us to continue walking, so I reasoned that we were supposed to stay where we were. Which is what we did. We stood there silently for a long, long time. My arms grew tired and I lowered them eventually. No one stopped me. Eventually I heard scraping sound coming from behind the guards. They parted and I saw what can only be described as a giant purple caterpillar inching its way towards me. The thing was enormous and covered in millions of fibers that danced an invisible breeze. Every few paces it would stop, one pair of flaps in the front, stare at me to make sure that I hadn't moved, and then close the flaps to resume its slow and measured march towards us. A mouth opened in the thing's body. Greetings, human, it said in a weirdly melodious voice, almost as if there were two voices singing in harmony with each other. I am High Counselor MacLaris, also known as MacLaris the Wise. No one else spoke up, so I took a stab at it. Hi, I said. I'm Jason Reese, also known as Captain Jason Reese, or Jason Reese the devilishly handsome and strangely brilliant consummate liar. Rifle butts to the small of the back are, apparently, the universal response from guards who think that you are being too much of a smartass. I dropped to my knees in pain. Your species has great difficulty in admitting defeat, Melchryoth observed. A personality flaw, I agreed through gritted teeth. A floor or an advantage often can be the same thing viewed from different lenses. The alien observed, a skilled jeweler must recognize both. That comment hit me harder than the rifle butt. I really looked like the alien for the first time. What the hell? I asked. I didn't think anyone else but humans had used metaphors. Oh yes, it said, sounding almost dismissive. The Havar have known for being deep thinkers. Few other species realize that deep thinking is as much practice skill as an innate ability. Complicated problems can overwhelm. However, if one can translate the problems into something simpler, then the mind can fathom. In terms of both more simple and more familiar, it can give the mind the ability to extrapolate from that simple set of solutions that may translate to a larger problem. Is that not so? 
I struggled to rise to my feet once more. I guess so, I admitted. I never really thought about it that much. Yes, Mokryas said. One of the many gifts of your kind is to not fully appreciate. You do not have to think about it. You simply do. The Chimera made a mistake with you, I think. What? I asked in surprise. By taking away telepathy, I mean. A VAR council member went on. They thought to make you better soldiers while also making you more docile and easily controllable. Instead, they locked down a mind never meant to fit into one head. The Havar are deep thinkers because our minds are so much faster than our bodies. Humans are deep thinkers because you so desperately wish to escape your own heads. I don't mind the occasional philosophical conversations, but the whole, uh, at gunpoint thing really put a damper on my mood. Right, now I would like to be physically somewhere else as well, I pointed out. The Havar Cilia rippled. For some reason, I thought it might indicate amusement. Still seeking a way to escape and turn this to your advantage. It said, and then, in a softer voice, it added, I envy you. Jason, Heather hissed in my ear as she stepped closer. There's something wrong with that thing's mind. It's like a... It's like a string is attached to it. Whatever else could be said about the Havar, there was nothing wrong with the hearing. Ah, Malkria said brightly. Your companion has hidden talents. He is correct. Incidentally, my mind is not entirely my own these days. It has not been in some time. Very astute observation. Well, I may as well take you to see one of the shadows now. I didn't bother correcting the alien on getting Heather's gender wrong. To it, we'd probably all look just as strange as it did. Besides, I was more interested in one of the shadow characters. The alien took a long time to turn around as it slowly scrunched up and twisted its body as it inched its way in a slow and careful arc. I decided to try asking questions. One of the shadows is a chimera? I asked. Oh, indeed. Alcryath agreed. The chimera do so love the ridiculous names. They usually follow a pattern of profession and rank within them. This one is a top SVNR's agent, so that's where the shadows part comes from. I think they've only recently started experimenting with dramatic and haven't quite gotten the hang of it yet. I frowned. You don't seem to like the Chimera very much, I found myself saying. Oh, I despise them, it said, with every fiber of my being. I curse their existence. But, um, you're working for them. Work implies I have some choice in the matter, the alien said wistfully. I believe one of the shadows is only allowing me to speak my mind at the moment or at least to some degree, because it amuses him to do so. Whether you believe it or not, none of this is entirely my choice. There was a dull thump for her up ahead. Nor was that, it said. What the hell? I asked. A bomb I set in the council chambers, it said. I probably killed off most of the high council. The low council is set further away, and, uh, of course, there were more of them. As it was a low-yield device, I am reasonably sure a large number of them survived. Still, this sudden power vacuum will cause quite a strife. It would be years before our government truly stabilizes, if it survives that long. The Cydia waved again. I suppose I can't blame you for bringing that ship here, it said, but I was hoping that you would continue to be my brisk for a little while longer. What is a break spit? I asked. More Cydia waving, definitely amusement. A piece of a favorite game amongst my kind, it explained. You would like it. A game of strategy as well as chance. Brixpit is one of the smaller pieces. Its value is due to the ability to thwart your opponent. Many great plans have been foiled due to her errant Brixpit. But of course, the danger of Brixpits is that they can turn on you as well. Maybe that's what happened at last to me. I think he was calling me a pawn, but his words may suggest something more than that, like a gaming piece that represented bad luck or random chance as well as a sacrificial nothing. This was twice someone had reduced my entire life into terms of a board game. Was this a universal thing or was it I'm running on to crappy people? Mulcryath eased his way down the corridor and we followed, slowly, with armed guards following us. Why did you set off the bomb in the council chambers? Lee asked suddenly. I had to the council member explained. I was not given a choice. One shadows forced me to place the bomb at my normal station. I was not even permitted to stay there and allow the explosion to end my misery. He forced me to leave the chambers and stand next to the door as the bomb went off. I had to listen to the walls, screams and voices that I recognize. Some that have been my friends for more years than you've been alive. Do you understand? No, 
Lee admitted. You talk like you were under his command. How are you able to tell us about this now? It amuses him to allow me this small freedom, Malchryath replied. He commands me still. I take you to him not because of my desire, but because I am unable to resist. I wish to advise you to flee, but I know if I do, you'll be skilled. The guards behind you are not entirely under their own free will either. I glanced back over my shoulder and let out a low whistle. He's controlling all of them at the same time, I asked. I do not think he is the mental resources to complete control of them, the alien answered. I think it's more like a, um, influencing their thoughts and beliefs, controlling what they can and cannot perceive. This conversation, for instance, I very much doubt they're hearing it. They probably are just hearing me arrest you or something similar. Admitting my guilt to the recent assassinations would be filtered out. What about the robots? Jack asked. Surely he can't use telepathy on them. No, the alien admitted. They have simply been reprogrammed. Shadow is cautious of your kind. You have proven to be oddly resourceful, especially in your ability to manipulate other sentient beings. I believe he wishes to study you before exterminating you. Where have I heard that before? I said aloud. This really must be a chimera thing. So you have faced a chimera before? The alien asked. One shadow said that he had a reason to believe that you had, but was unsure of the outcome, only that you had obviously managed to escape. I shrugged. Not a lot of them left alive to stop us from doing so. I touched boastfully. I didn't know the one of shadows was listening in or not. If he was, I was sort of hoping to imply that we'd massacred a bunch of his kind to make him approach us a bit cautiously. True, it might make him decide to fill us full of holes and not let us anywhere near him. However, my brief exposure to Chimera made me think otherwise. Chimera, as far as I could tell, were basically a curious bunch. Whether that was because they had started incorporating human DNA, or it was a native instinct, I wasn't sure. It was an odd point of common ground between our species. Most of the species we'd run across so far had displayed only minimum curiosity. They looked at the universe through the eyes of a herd animal, like Bray. They were slow to investigate, and if something appeared dangerous, they would get to safety first. Humans and Chimera, though, they were predators. Apex predators. If something slaughtered our biggest and strongest, we wanted to know what it was. Furthermore, how to kill it. It was a reckless sort of curiosity that propelled humans to amazing heights and devastating crashes, often within the same lifetime. We couldn't leave things alone. We had to poke at them. If it was dangerous, we wanted to tame it. If it couldn't be tamed, we wanted to annihilate it. The universe was our plaything, and if it didn't bend to our will, we upped the heat. If I were dealing with another human, I would estimate the boast would be our chances of surviving long enough for our enemy to at least take a look at us to be around 50-50. The problem with dealing with humans is that as recklessly curious as we might be, we're unpredictable in how we choose to quench that thirst for knowledge. If an alien appeared on Earth boasting that he'd mowed his way through a battalion of soldiers, humans might just lob a nuke at it and only start asking questions when they sifted through the radioactive ash. Questions like, can he survive a thermonuclear explosion? Unless you are sufficiently prepared to answer such a question as in the affirmative, it is generally a bad idea to talk to homicidically aggressive primates. The point is that I wasn't dealing with a human. I was dealing with a chimera and Gaimera had an Achilles heel. An instinct that had survived all of the various bodily mutations, something older than curiosity, something that they couldn't resist and was shaping them even today. Chimera were greedy. They wanted what they did not have. If you presented yourself as a stronger than they were, they wanted that strength. After centuries of tinkering with humans, distilling what they thought was the best at discarding the chaff, they ran across an original specimen telling them that they screwed up and discarded the wrong bit. They would want to know what it was, even if it turned out to be a lie. They couldn't let it drop until they were sure. Dangle something tempting in front of a chimera, and they'd come out of their hole to take a bite. They couldn't help it. So paradoxically, our chances of survival, at least until the point of actually squaring off with that jerk, actually went up to where we presented ourselves as a threat. I'm not even too sure the Chimera themselves really understood the Achilles heel. However, as if confirming my suspicions, I saw a strange ripple go across the city of the Makariath. This time it wasn't amusement, this was more frantic and less organized. Fear. 
You should not have done that, dear human, Malkrath stated flatly. I believe that you are attracting the wrong sort of attention. You're right, I agreed. Someone too cowardly to face us on our own is not who I want to talk to. If he has to hide behind mercenaries and kill bots, he's obviously not worth our time. Human, the alien said quickly, you must cease this. You are angering him. Anger? I asked. How the hell can he possibly feel anger? Curling up in a fetal position and whiffing his own ball sweat sounds more like terror to me. Human, our host said warningly. Come to think of it, I went on. Maybe he just likes the aroma. I mean, hell, he went through all that trouble of stealing this DNA. He may as well enjoy the taint. I've wondered about that, he added. I mean, what is the freaking point of stealing DNA? Too much of a frick up to do your own evolving. You have to wait for someone else to do the trailblazing for you. I nodded. Genetic cowardice, I agreed. They can't be asked to take any risks themselves. They wait for everyone else to do the hard work for them. Look at this latest one. It's pathetic. They try to enslave humans. It doesn't work. Humans rebel. So they let the enemy wipe us out. That doesn't work either. They are left scratching their rears as their barely civilized apes constantly outwit them. So what do they do? They try and build a better human. Eat one of them and screw that up too. I'm starting to wonder why in the hell everyone is so afraid of these jerks. It's like bringing a farm animal into the house, Lee explained. Yeah, it makes the walk to slaughter them shorter, but mostly they crap all over the carpeting and make a mess. Who can blame the conflux for wanting to put them back in their pen? The jerks can't do anything right unless they steal something from someone better than they are. I was glad to see that Lee was following my lead. Did he get where we were going? Come to think of it, did I get where we were going? Maybe. The Fey and the Chimera were both arrogant, more so than humans were, and uh, believe me, that's saying a lot. They were quick to anger and, uh, like most people, got much stupider when they were angry. That's okay when you can grow 15 feet tall and turn green, but it's generally a huge minus for battles against an intelligent opponent. We needed to draw him out. We were slower, we were weaker, but maybe if we got him angry enough, we were smarter than him too. Yep, dumb plan, I specialty. I think that you two need to go watching shut up, Shide spoke up. Frick, Shide, it was going to be ruin everything. I needed to bring him up to speed before sabotaging everything with the big words, just covaging confused them, he went on. You need to speak with our words. I heard a rustle of cloth behind me. God damn it, the professor yelled. Put that away. Oh, but he covaging came so far to see this, Shide moaned. That's disgusting, the professor added. Are you really going to do that here? Now? Mm-hmm, Shide said. Gross, Jack added. Oh, but the chimera want our genetics, he gasped. I am going to give it to him, something I'll take a long time to read. Chide, I said, still refusing to look around. You're not helping anything. Besides, you're just going to make it easier for him to collect a sample. Lap at the kavaj up. Not exactly what I had in mind, I said. Look, we're trying to have an intelligent discussion here about the blithering idiot. Can't go we go five minutes without you choking the... Oh, he moaned. Existential terror from telepathic corpse-stealing worms always puts me in the right mood. Okay, someone's going to have to pull the release valve of the squadger, or it's likely to punch a hole in the wall. Will you shut the hell up? Mulcryeth shouted, except it wasn't Mulcryeth. Not quite. His voice was different, edgier, more frayed. It sounded very similar to the voice I heard of the com, except now the same voice has barely contained its fury. You are the most foul-mouthed and obnoxious species that I have ever had the misfortune of encountering. The alien hissed. He kept his eye flaps closed, but uh, somehow I still got the impression that it was glaring at us. Is that one with shadows? I asked, slightly cooing as I spoke. Did you decide to come out and play like a big boy after all? Died. Lee spoke up. It threw me off for a moment and I glanced at Lee. Lee was staring fixedly away from where Shide should be. Shide, he repeated. Are you still back there wanking it? Mm-hmm. So was the response. Stop that. Can't. Built up too much head of steam. It's safer if we let it ride and have gravity do the work once we get down this hill and up the next. What the hell does that mean? Come what you find, though, he admitted. But your girlfriend has some nice big ones and they're sort of hill-shaped. And maybe, if you're feeling generous, will you stop? My cryer's shadow bellowed. Believe me, he said. I'm trying to get him to. The chimera ignored us. Why does your species insist on provoking confrontation? It asked. 
It's as if you feed off discord. Better than feeding off dead babies, Shide commented and then added, Ah, Kavodge, that killed the mood. Nothing like bringing up dead babies to make it go all limp. Unless they're dead chimera babies. Oh, boy, it's back again, fellas. Her voice broke and the caterpillar-like creature shuddered once. In that moment, I think one of Shadow's control must have slipped, because when the creature spoke again, its voice was completely different. Now, the angry voice of the chimera, nor the polite sing-song voice of the greeted us. This was a strained and desperate voice, trying to spit out something that had been forbidden for too long. Not all robots. It grasped as its seizure struck it. It was brief, but it was all the warning we were getting. Fortunately... It was enough. Barely. I spun around and faced our robotic escorts. Most of the robots looked like, well, robots. Metallic things and pistons of articulated limbs. They were only vaguely shaped like organic beings. Why would they need to be? It doesn't take a humanoid to point a gun and voice threats. Tanks do the job just as well. Indeed, a couple of them looked almost like tanks complete with armored treads. But one robot stood out from the rest. It had been so fixated on their guns that I missed it before. This one robot was shaped like a human, not a humanoid, human. Five fingers, thumb, and a bipedal locomotion. It was exactly like a human, but not just any human. Now that I was looking at it, and I mean really looking at it, I could recognize it. It wasn't quite the same. It was made from a different material, but the lines were the same. It was shaped almost exactly like the armor that I was familiar with, the armor that I had worn multiple times myself. The false robot reached up and grabbed its head. With a furious yank, it sent the lumpy-shaped ceiling into exposed plate and far too angular face below. A halo of white spilled out from the armor's shoulders and it pointed his rifle at us. You insolent! One of the shadows snarled. Hold that thought, I interrupted, and I looked around for Quok standing nearby. He was doing an alien coward dance of his kind. No surprise. You remember when you asked me a question a little while ago? I asked the former captain. What? He asked as he looked at my direction. Yes, I said. We did have two tricks up our sleeves. Almost literally. I undid the front of my coverall and reached the rear armpit. There was a reason people with a concealed carry permit use armpit holsters. As it turns out, it's a pretty damn nice hiding place. Particularly if you're wearing some material that allows you to stick a weapon to it, more or less in any position you want. I tore the plasma braid free and activated. Jack and Lee, on the other hand, had gotten first pick of the modest weapons cache that the Ron had so thoughtfully provided for us. They had a couple of Ron pistols and they were already firing it by the time that I had my blade out. Better reflexes, or oh, I did, I just struck that badly. No matter. Shide, who, incidentally, was never really actually spanking it despite what he may have led certain fate to believe, withdrew a collapsible Wutar. Yes, the entire time that he did his routine, he was just reaching into his coveralls and creating a grip of his staff. I mean the expanding one, not the other one. Ugh. For further clarification, it the expanding staff he could actually reach and wasn't covered with his Ron suit. Jack and the professor were playing along because they knew that he was reaching for his weapon. Again, reaching for the weapon he couldn't actually touch. Look, people, stop smirking. The material is extra thick over the crotch region anyway for added protection. He really couldn't have felt anything even if he decided to play. Tickle the Loch Ness monster. Anyway, leave it to shy to hide a foot-long pole in his crotch region and figure out what no one would notice. Except no one really did notice. There was that. Also, leave it to shy to feign a masturbation to hide the fact that he was drawing a weapon. Except, again, it worked. Something is clearly wrong with my strategies when Pervert's tactical decisions work out better than my own. That's beside the point. What is relevant is that the Ron clearly had been experimenting with the... Uh, uh, rod, because it worked with a bit different than before. It still expanded to over six feet in length. Yes, but when he whipped it out and around the cracked against the froggy Merc's head, there was a flash of light. This part was new. The Merc went flying and two more dropped before they had a chance to draw their weapons as Lee and Jack fired into them. That left Heather, the Professor, and me to pick up the slack. Except, no it didn't. Heather's plasma blade was already slicing a wide arc that connected the heads of the two killbots with the mist vaporizing steel. The Professor, on the other hand, had thrown her blade given the Mercs a choice between standing there and getting sliced up with the hot spinning death. 
Dodging towards the right, he was met with gunfire. Or dodging to the left would be clobbered by either Heather or Shide. It was a tough call. While they considered it, I charged at the armored fake Chimera while screaming a battle cry. He looked up at me and lifted his fist in my direction. Wait, weren't these lasers wrists in that armor? Frick! I dived to the side and just in time to avoid the initial volley of the coherent light. That's about when we became really and truly fricked. End of chapter. The fourth wave, chapter 107. Things got really confusing, really quickly. The armor of lasers speared a shot at where I'd just been standing. There was a temporary reprieve at best as, uh, really, there was no way to dodge a laser. No matter how fast I moved, there was just no way to cover enough ground. All he had to do was twitch his wrist and I was done for. Compared to the speed of light, I was, essentially, not moving. Relative velocities were a real witch when it came to dodging. Fortunately, I didn't have to dodge again. I never saw Shied move, as luck would have it, neither did one of Shadows. Shied's Wutar flashed upwards and slapped the Shadow's wrists upwards, like Chimera's lasers tore deep gouges into the ceiling. I normally don't need a huge invitation in such a situation, and didn't need one now. I leapt forward and stabbed my blade directly towards his chest. Nam, he was fast. I don't know how he saw me, but he had some sort of early warning sense going. All I had knew was that I was looking upwards at the ceiling one moment and then darting backwards and to the side faster than the eye could see. Still, there was a bright flash of light followed by a smell of something burning. Cursing, one of the shadows came to a halt a few feet away from me and inspect inspected his armor. The tip of my blade had just barely made contact with him. Where the blade had touched the armor had split and melted. A shower of sparks jetted out from where the blade cut. The chimera armor was tough. Yes, but the blade was like the heart of a sun. There were a limit to everything. Still, cursing, one of shadows reached up and touched the section of his armor. It popped off his hand. He chucked it aside. Now there was a four-inch and three-inch section of the exposed flesh just above his heart. That, he declared with a snarl, is the last time that you'll cut me. He sprang forward as the blur of motion. They are fast on their own. Their ruggedized endoskeleton combined with the biomechanical enhancements basically meant they got the same benefits of the power armor buried under their skin. A fey wearing power armor on top of his own enhancements was unbelievably fast. A chimera using the best of confined from fey biology and pumping it up for his own use while wearing later generation armor. Too fast for the eye to follow. We would be dead in a milliseconds and I'd never feel it. However, there were two things we had going for us. There were six of us, and there was afraid to let our weapons touch him. As long as we was moving, he was safe, but the moment he paused to shoot, punch, kick, or change directions, we sprang on him in mass. Even with enhanced reflexes, he only had four limbs to fight us off with, which was too many. So began the weirdest stalemate in the universe has probably ever seen. He disappeared, he swung around the wildly shooting, bashing our blades, or twirling that stupid wootar of shies, and as soon as he appeared, we had all leap in the direction and only have him disappear again. The Ron suits didn't make us faster or stronger than a normal human. We could just tap into a strength and speed of a lot more than biology alone should permit. So, while we were slow and clumsy in comparison to one of Shadow's, we were still bouncing around the confines of space in the corridor with lots of frantic energy. By unspoken mutual agreement, we kept our movements erratic. I hoped that, as fast as we were moving, that hitting a target that was also moving on its own weird tangents was presenting itself as a challenge. I was half right. Shooting us was a problem. Doing a drive-by punch in the ribcage seemed to be much easier. I collapsed to the floor as something blurred in front of me and my chest exploded, where my ribs actually broken. Inhaling hurt more than it had any right to ache. Breathing should not be painful. The air and something felt like it was pressing in my lungs downwards. I kept inhaling and the ache eased off. My ribs, for a wonder, seemed to be intact. Bruised, yes, maybe even a few of them were cracked, but I didn't seem to have any of them sticking out my lungs either. It hurt to breathe, it hurt to move, but I was alive and that's what mattered. I gathered my feet under me and tried to stand. It wasn't happening. I'd been asking a lot of my body and it had formed a union and went on strike. 
So I surveyed the damage around us instead. For the most part, all the mercs, androids, and otherwise were out of commission. Most of the robots were smashed and lying about in pieces. One robot had its legs and one arm chopped off and was dragging itself away from the action as if it was looking for a Sarah Connor. Closer to me was the frog-faced mercs, most of them had seen better days as well. My friends had gotten the drop on the mercenaries and had dispatched them quickly. Once again, I was reminded what I came down to the hand-to-hand combat that really wasn't such a thing as a fair fight between a human and most aliens. The two of the mercs had been tossed into the wall with enough force to leave a dent. I wasn't sure if that was due to the kinetic guns or if we just had thrown them. Probably the former, but one of them had its arms stretched out in front and twisted into an unnatural angle, so I couldn't rule out brute force. Another was on the ground groaning and trying to protect its legs with its arms. The legs weren't moving and had strangely limping appearance to them. Broken. Other mercs lay dead or dying, including the one was barely close to me and dropped its rifle. Standing, I might not be able to do, but that didn't mean I was entirely out of the fight. With a painful lurch, I stretched out my grabbed the rifle by the barrel and dragged it towards me. I looked around and saw my friends and concentrating their efforts on the far end of the corridor. Now that the odds were only five to one, the Chimera seemed to be willing to stop every so often to try and get a shot off. So far, he hadn't hit anyone, but I was certain that that wouldn't last. Tie your shoes, everyone, I shouted. Four people dropped to the floor immediately. Shide fell a little slower as he shot me a confused look. Fortunately, Jack was beside him and anticipated this. She grabbed his arm as she fell and dragged him down half a second behind her. The Chimera stopped as they dropped and looked up in my direction. I pulled the trigger. I set the gun to full auto and emptied the power pack in the Chimera's direction. The corridor was lit up with bolts of energy surging through the air. And then I heard a whoomp sound and I was flying backwards as the rifle was yanked from my hands. I landed on my rear and skidded across the floor along my back. The Chimera stood where I had been a moment before. He glared at me, his lips twisted into an ugly snarl. There were a few pock marks on his armor and lay testament to the fact that, despite his early warnings, I definitely hit him again. That seemed to anger him more than anything else. Oh yeah, humans are resistant to energy weapons and, uh, by extension, the Chimera would be too. But the armor and all that it had done has been no worse for a few beastings. I was not making friends today. My stolen rifle was in his hands. He looked at it once and then at go of it with one hand. He raised his free hand and pointed his fist in my direction. I was still on my back. It would take too long to get into position to dodge. I could feel that there was more burns and rust charging up. Then he looked away from me and brought up his rifle up and around to his left. He braced with both hands in a moment before throwing blade sliced through it. Heather was up and charging at him. He tried to shoot her with his burners, but she twisted to the side before he could get a bead on her. The blade slashed through the air where he had been. He dodged it, but he was clearly shocked by the fact that she'd been able to avoid his first attack. That shock was slowing him down. It really wasn't much of an advantage, but Heather pressed it all the same. She slashed at his head and forced him to duck. He tried to roll to his right and she changed directions with a blade and downward stroke to intercept him. He flopped backwards onto his spine, allowing the blade to pass by harmlessly. He kicked his feet into the air and he did a backward somersault to land on his feet once more. It was five feet away from her now, too far away for her to cut with a blade. Heather didn't bother rushing him. She held back as twin blasts caught shadows in the crossfire. I had forgotten that Lee and Jack were equipped with pistols. Apparently, so had one of shadows. Unlike my energy weapon, the Ron pistols piled force fields that caused mayhem with pure kinetic energy. The armor could only dampen it so much as the Chimera was struck with the force of two freight train engines striking him in tandem. I ducked by reflex as he flew over my head and towards the wall. Somehow, I am not sure exactly how he did it. He curled into a ball and flew and rotated until his feet were pointed towards the wall. I swear, I heard a bone snap as he hit the wall, but that didn't slow him down. Relying on the super-fast healing bolt into the fey physiology, he sprang off the wall almost before he finished absorbing the blow with his legs. He flew away, twisted in midair, and landed in front of Heather. He immediately had to duck and drop to the side as a blade cut to the air where he had been standing. Rick, I bumped uglies with the Jedi. How awesome was that? She swung her blade backwards to where he was rolling and caused him to divert directions again. 
Once more she sensed this before he did it and made it alter her own course. Then, idly, she froze in place and dropped her blade. One of the shadows jumped to his feet and growled. You tipped your hand, human, he said. I don't know how you gained these abilities, but you should realize by reading my mind. You opened the door to... Ah! That last bit was compliments of a wootar cracking against the backside of his head. Points were shined for not letting the bad guy get into his monologue. He rolled forward and away from the blow. There was still a flash of light, but I got some impression that I hadn't quite delivered a full punch. Probably because the jerk was back up on his feet a second and growling once more. So far, we had been dealing with more and more than we were receiving, but that didn't matter because he was shrugging off that same damage, as if we were little more than flies. At the same time, he had effectively incapacitated two of our fighters with minimal effort. I was only just finding the strength to stand once more, and Heather, I confirmed with a glance in her direction, was still frozen. But wait, something was different. I looked back. Her blade was missing. With a crackle of energy, I heard the missing blade snap to life. I whirled around, expecting to see one with shadows charging at me with a stolen blade. But no, it was the professor. She was charging in with a plasma blade in each hand and twirling them around like a death-dealing major rat. One of shadows tried to disappear again. He started moving fast but found himself brought up short by the professor. She stood in the middle of the corridor and extended her arms out to the sides. The whirling blades hummed as they slashed in the air mere inches away from the wall. He couldn't go that direction. She advanced slowly, narrowing the space where he could move. Jack and Lee got the hint and crept up behind her and fired over her shoulders down the corridor in his direction. With less space to run, he found it harder to dodge the bolts of kinetic force hurled in his direction. A glancing blow in here and a new mess there, but the shots were getting closer as he found less and less room to retreat. Shide appeared beside me and helped me to my feet. Want to stomp a cavodging cow to it and see how far it squirts? He asked. Not as poetic as its clobbering time, but I caught his meaning. Still finding it difficult to catch my breath, I nodded in agreement and we started advancing down the corridor. I still had my plasma blade somehow. I ignited it and held it low and then ready for a swing. Shide walked in front of me with his wootar twirling in front of him. The message was clear. Even if one of Shadows tried attacking my friends in front of us, he'd never get past us too. We were winning. I felt a flicker of optimism. I really need to stop doing that. A blur of motion that had been one of Shadows suddenly stopped moving long enough to slap her palms against the wall beside him. Nothing happened, not on this end of the corridor anyway. But on my end, something did happen. The wall beside me opened up. Just for the briefest of moments, the sight of a black space and white rocky planet face surprised me. I thought that somehow he had opened the airlock and I was about to be blown out and die upon the airless surface of the planet. But no, it was just a window of some sort. Still, it startled me and I must have gasped in surprise because the next thing I knew I was making eye contact with Lee, Professor and Jack who had all turned around to see if I was alright. Which meant none of us were looking at the Chimera. The professor screamed as a blur knocked her off her feet. Her blades went wild and slicing back towards her where Lee was standing. She would have cut him in half if she hadn't had the presence of mind to switch off the blades. They tumbled out of her hands as she let go of them to brace for impact. Lee forgot himself for a moment and, by reflex, I imagined, turned to help her. They tumbled together in a lump on the floor. The blur, never slowing down, did something to Jack. I heard a crack as the bone snapping as she crumpled to the floor screaming. She dropped a pistol, forgotten. The blow was past them and Shide's Wutar was out of his hands and swinging at him. I had been describing events as if they were happening one after the other, but to me, it was as if they all happened at once. The professor screamed and fell into Lee. Jack fell to the floor screaming, all while Shide somehow managed to block the first blow from the Wutar with his own forearm. Again, I heard a sickly sound of bone snapping. Shide dropped his useless left arm and made a sliding move to the right. The Wutar missed him, barely, and Shide punched with his good arm in the direction of where the blur should be. He missed, but frick, give Shide credit. He lasted longer in hand-to-hand -hand stuff against the Chimera than he had any right to. The blur did something and a punch, I imagine, and Shide was crumpling to the floor unconscious. Then, before I could blink my eyes, one of Shadows was behind me and his arm was around my neck. One of his wrist lasers pressed to my head. 
I don't think so, one of the shadows hissed. Drop the weapons, now. I slapped my blade to my thigh and let it go. Wait, he said, weapons. I rolled my eyes in the direction of the heap of where Lee and the professor and Jack had fell. Jack's pained expression on her face was sitting up on the floor and while the twisted leg stretched out to the side, she had a pistol trained in my direction. She lowered it. Lee and the professor were disdangling themselves and saw Lee was already bringing up his own pistol to point my direction. He too stopped and lowered his. That's about the time I noticed the sound of dozens of feet marching in unison down the corridor. Nate, as usual, one of his shadows commented. He sounded almost amused. I swear, he said, it's the same all over. Security is never there when you need them. Ah, oh, well, as a done distraction at least, I could not have realized how entertaining your kind could be. So optimistic. Still, even you must recognize your complete failure. Surrender now and, uh, and I didn't really care. I had enough of this jerk for one lifetime. With no better idea of what to do, I activated my comm. Dyer, I grunted past the arm with his half choking me. I'm not asking you as your captain, I'm asking as a friend, will you shoot this mother fracker? Certainly, Jason, came the reply, locking in on your comms now. What? One of shadows said. He was surprised, and in that moment of confusion, he loosened his grip on me as he yanked his head round to look at the window behind him. I twisted free and dived for the floor, and the window filled the most brilliant light I'd ever seen. It was a deafening boom, following by intense heat. Without thinking about it, I nodded my head and activated my helmet. The bright light and the sound subsided as I tossed about by, uh, well, something. It felt like a giant hand had set his hand on fire and was throwing me around the room. I bounced off the wall and the ceiling and then I was bouncing off something else, hard but with a gritty texture. My ears were ringing and my faceplate dialed back the polarization just a bit. I was outside, everything was ridiculously bright. Even though the faceplate and I could tell there was a blinding glare. In front of me was a building with a huge irregular hole in the side of it. Beyond that, I could see a couple dozen of the froggy mercs floundering on the floor. Lee was on his feet and running in the direction. Then, it was gone. A black hemisphere of force covered the hole. Some sort of force field designed to contain the leak. I must have been, but, uh, where was the chimera? I looked behind me and saw him struggling to his feet. Unlike me, he didn't have a helmet. His collar force field was trying to compensate for his now and the slow air leaking from his suit. Still, I could see the vapor jetting outwards from the fields weakening and didn't completely seal off the air. There was no sound. Was I still deaf? No, that wasn't it. Well, not entirely. There was no air out here. The guy mirror opened his mouth and threw back his head. He was screaming. As I watched, his pearly white skin grew darker and then turned black and began to bubble. He was being roasted from the bright light and intense radiation bombarding the surface of the planet. He lowered his head and scanned the area. It was futile. His eyes were milky orbs that saw nothing. He opened his mouth and appeared to scream again. Pain or challenge? As I watched, I saw the blackened and bubbling skin on his face slough off and uh, reveal a new pink skin underneath. He was regenerating. As fast as it was burning him, his body was trying to heal him from it. The new pink skin darkened and turned black as well. In a matter of a few minutes, he would lose and regrow his face over and over again. Presumably, his eyes were trying to regenerate as well, only to be blind over time and time again. The pain must be overwhelming. I struggled to rise to my feet, only to see him extend his arms to full length and begin firing his wrist-mounted laser. He tried to spin in place to cut the chest-high swath the ground. I dived for the ground and allowed the beams to pass overhead. My helmet darkened again and I blinked a few times before the faceplate brightened again and allowed me to see the crater where the chimera had been standing before. Off to the side, I saw a charred and smoking figure curled up in a fetal position. The sky above me brightened and I looked upwards. Huge cannons sprouted forth from the top building where the firing into the night sky. Apologies, Jason, Dyer said over the gum. They have pinpointed my location and are returning fire. Several ships are attempting to board me. I must concentrate on personal defenses before I can provide additional support. Thank you, Dyer, I said. You've done more than I could ever have asked. You're the best ship anyone could ever hope for and a better friend than I deserve. Thank you, sir, 
Dyer said as his usual flat and emotionless, devoid voice. However, I feel I should warn you that I was not able to get a direct lock on your opponent from this distance. I fear I may not have scored a direct hit. You may find that he is not entirely incapacitated. I looked over. Frick! Home for crying out loud! Give me a break. Even as I watched the smoldering hulk of the Chimera was standing again, a shower of sparks flowed from his damaged armor and he was forced to remove sections of it. He tore free the damaged sections over his right shoulder and arm. The skin was bare beneath and immediately turned black in the harsh rays of the world. The arm pulled upon itself, drying out like a mummy. Still, it worked. He used his damaged arm as he could arm left to tear away more charred sections of his armor, exposing legs and even what was left of his stomach. Only his left arm, his chest and his right leg were still armored now. Even those bits did not seem to be operating normally. The gash jet above his head fluctuated, allowing irregular sized clouds at the field struggled to keep his head in atmosphere. His armored arm moved stiffly. He pointed it at the side and waited. A moment later, a weak laser shot out from it, and it was underpowered, and he couldn't fire it continuously. But it could still kill me if he got a lucky shot in my direction. Freck and double Freck. I dropped on my hands and knees and crawled on my belly in his direction. He rotated like a clock, and he sent spurts of erratic laser fire out as he turned slowly in place. As before, with the helmet in place, the world seemed simpler. My friends were trapped behind the force field and facing armed mercenaries. But Lee was on his feet last I saw him, so that wasn't a concern. My ship was under fire, but there was still a ship out there that could take the tire blade that I hadn't seen it. So that wasn't a concern. All that mattered was executing the menace in front of me. No matter how many times I'd donned that helmet, my thought processes while wearing it were almost seemed alien to me. It all made sense at the time. I knew that my friends and the ship were in danger themselves, but I didn't worry about it. The danger affecting them wasn't something that I could do anything about, so I didn't bother wasting mental energy on it. I still liked them even then. I'm pretty sure that I was sincere when I had just told Daya he was a better friend than I deserved. The words didn't feel hollow then, but uh, at the same time a friend seemed to have a different definition. There were people, or a ship, that I was okay with helping with no desire to harm. The pricker in front of me. Different story. He had to die. I crawled towards him on the moon-like surface of the planet, and dust covered as I crawled, but I ignored it. He couldn't see me. It was impossible to hear me. He couldn't even read my mind. The only way that he could find me was if proximity sensors in his suit were still working, and, uh, crap. I rolled to the side as he pointed his wrist at me. A moment later, the ground where I'd been exploded. There was a delay between the time he wanted to fire and the time the laser actually left the barrel. It wasn't much, but it gave me a chance to dodge. I scurried to one side and raced towards him again. He tried to get a bead on me again, and once more I managed to jump to the side. He tried to track me, but apparently even the proximity sensors weren't giving him a good enough idea of my location. Sudden movements seemed to confuse it. Okay, we'll do it that way. I scrambled on my feet and ran at him in a zigzag fashion. He whipped his head around and blindly as he searched for me, his arm moving in a jerkily from left to right. He was having problems. By the time he realized what I was almost upon him, it was too late. I grabbed him as a flying tackle and we skidded across the moon's surface with me on top of him as I lifted myself up upon a punch him in the face three times. He was in pain. It made him slower and weaker, but he still was stronger and tougher than me. Despite the padding and the gloved hands allowing me to really let loose, the impacts were barely enough to hurt him. Or maybe he was also in so much pain that they didn't even register. He shook them off and he reached up for my neck, so I stopped punching him and reached for my leg where I'd stashed the plasma blade. I fired it up. I was sitting on his chest, even within the strength of his pure physics was keeping him pinned down. I'd never have a better shot. Gripping the handle in both hands, I plunged the glowing tip towards his exposed region of his chest. My arm stopped just short of making contact. Two hands gripped my arms in a vice-like grip. How the hell had he been doing that without seeing me? I put my weight behind and pushed down. My damaged ribs ached with exertion. I had gravity on my side, and he was hurt and couldn't recruit as much muscle as he fight me as normal. His armor was damaged, so he only had implants and augmented his fading strength. Still, 
He was strong and I wasn't making much headway, much being of the operative word. The blade drifted downwards by a millimeter. Then the headache started. I started low and then the back of my skull. I thought at first it was just a tension from all the exertion and, well, the lung damage. Something I could ignore, but it grew stronger and somehow deeper. It took an odd characteristic, something alien to myself. Don't ask me how I knew this, I just knew. Too late, I remembered Heather. The combination of lowered mental defenses and true desperation on the part of the Fae had allowed it to implant a part of himself in her mind. The headache grew and both it developed a resonance, some weird reverb that almost reminded me of voices. Then it stopped reminding me of voices and actually became voices. You are weak, the voice scolded. Drive this creature out. Hey, I remember that voice. Abjugators. But the Chimera claimed that the abjugators were now their puppets. But this sounded like the other way around. No, it couldn't be. You guys let the Chimera think you were pulling the strings, didn't you? I thought. I can't explain what happened next except the color shift. I wasn't seeing anything different, not yet, but that's what I felt like. Like my thoughts were in a sapia before that and there were now a tiny bit of color leaking into one spot. One of shadows didn't know. Oh, this was fun. The blade twitched closer. I almost had to admire the abjugators for this one. They knew how to play the long con. They just rolled right over once you tried out the new mental powers, didn't they? I said, and then out of it came aloud this time. It helped me focus my words. You thought, I said with a grunt, that you were a psychic big boys on the block, so you took over the old guys in this time and you were going to win once and for all. The color patch in my mind darkened. Did that mean I was getting close? You forgot, I said, still pushing down, that abjugators aren't like other psychics. They can join together, shout as one. Individually, you may be stronger, but what about ten abjugators, or a hundred, or a thousand? How many can you hold out against, and what was it you said to Heather? By reading your mind, she opened a door, was it? Being psychic also means that you opened a door into your own mind. The color darkened and well twisted. It wasn't just a color either. I saw it in one of Shadow's face. He was losing focus. Just a bit more. The trick with destroying the galaxy is pretty sweet, I went on. Did you guys come up with that on your own, or did you just arrive at the flash of inspiration? Don't bother answering, because I'll answer for you. Your keystone, the ship that was supposed to detonate out here. Why was it located at the outpost nearest Earth? Why not closer to here? Why was it one that they knew about? I'll tell you why. It was never meant to go off here. There was going to be an accident. It was meant to go off near Earth. Your plan was never meant to succeed. The Conflux would find out about it just in time that be helpless and stop the destruction of Earth. The last part left a bitter taste in my mouth. Still, it fit. It felt right. As I spoke, more and more of the puzzle pieces were fitting into place and blinding speed. Why else would the Conflux suddenly get interested in Earth again at this particular time? I went on, and sending a ranking member of the church, no less. A church founded to rid the universe of you. When he died, as the dire blade exploded, and the entire conflux would be stirred up. They'd redouble their efforts and exterminate you, especially once they found out that you'd already set up explosions to render their part of the galaxy uninhabitable. You'd be forced to retreat, with the conflux breathing down your neck the entire way. A flash, a protest, I think. Yes, I said, you were meant to lose the fourth wave, just like the other three waves. The abjugators don't want you to win. They want the conflict to draw out forever. Now, thanks to you, the Ron, the Fair Traders, and the Envoy are getting tossed into the mix. Now, we're all going to be at each other's throats right in your neck of the woods. They want the war to be stepped up, to drive out all of you to the brink of extinction, to knock you back to the Stone Age. More flashy. Except we screwed it up, I went on. Humans didn't play by the rules, so they tried sending us to the sphere to lead the church to it and then force the conflict there. They wanted the conflux to find it. They wanted the conflux on high alert to look out for other little devices and uh, hopefully to wipe out humanity as well. Except to do that, they needed to be discovered. Don't you see, Shadows? You got played. I bet you thought facing me was one of your ideas. You could have shot me down while we were still in our ship, but uh, no, you had to do this personally. 
to take out six humans at once, you were supposed to die. The only reason the abjugators are helping you now is because... My voice faltered, and it became so clear. Because of what's in my head, I said slowly. They want you to kill me because if I can get this program or whatever in amongst them, that's what I need. I needed a powerful psychic to give them a direct link. That's why I was trying to tell myself. One of Shadows wasn't fighting me as hard anymore, so I took the chance to split my attention. I closed my eyes and concentrated. Then a weird thing happened. I still was there on the surface of the planet pushing down on the plasma blade, but I was also back on the island. It was like two places were superimposed over one another. The island looked better than before. Lush vegetation covered the interior, and palm trees swayed in the breeze. The beach was biggest changed, however. All around the perimeter of the island, right where the sand met the ocean, there were these tall wooden barricades. They seemed to be made out of trunks of palm trees. As I stared, I heard a loud explosion. Just over the top of the barricade, I could see it, the tip of a sailing ship. A puff of white smoke rose up from the bellows of the wooden perimeter in front of me shook violently. Then it stopped all at once. They were firing cannons at me, but that palm tree barrier was holding them back. Palm trees and cannons. Something clicked. Sullivan's Island, I said. About time you figured it out. A voice that was familiar and not so behind me said. I turned to face him. Or, well, face me. Although you said I wouldn't see you anymore, I pointed out. Well, I, he said while scratching the gold and blue tattoos on his chin. That's when we were integrating. Now your mind is splitting off from the program again and, um, forget the exposition, I said. We had enough of that. You're here so that you must mean that you're getting ready to head off and join the abjugator ranks. He nodded and pointed past me out to the ocean. Through there, if I can make it, he said. I looked back and saw that there was a blemish in the pale blue sky just beyond the ship, a swirling vortex of black light. No, don't ask how light can be black, just take it from me. It was glowing black. The abjugators, I asked as I turned to face my doppelganger again. He nodded once and then smiled. You do realize this probably isn't what Sullivan's Island really looks like, don't you? He asked. I sighed. I've never seen South Carolina, I pointed out. So how would I, um... Um, we? No, huh? I just thought that it was an interesting story for my history class, about the only part of the Revolutionary War that I found interesting. I shook my head. I didn't even remember the name of the fort, I protested. Yet you must have if I can say it. I ignored that. I guess the story's just stuck with me, you know? I went on, British ships firing upon a flimsy wooden fort with their cannons. It shouldn't have been able to stand up the assault, but it did. An accidental building material turns to a tide of battle. His grin spalted. Yeah, he said with a sigh. Probably a metaphor for humanity itself in there somewhere. But I'm just too lazy to draw it out. Who cares? I asked. No one wants to hear about symbolism. We have a battle to fight. He nodded and looked out into the sea again. I need to get to that portal, he repeated. That ship is a weenie of shadows and that vortex behind him is the abjugators. They were trying to reinforce him and give him a better ammo. They didn't realize that your flimsy-looking barricade is actually made of palmetto. They'd have a lot of hammering to do before they could break through that. As if to punctuate the idea, the barricade shook again. The problem, he continued, is that now they realize you've figured it out and they're going to hold Rira to try something else. They're probably only hanging around long enough to flip the kill switch. Kill switch? I asked. Not yours, he explained. Remember, telepathy is a double-edged sword. You can influence others, but you open the door to influence. Without a really powerful psychic to bridge your mind to that of the abdicators, this won't work. Even though the chimera really isn't breaking through, his assault on you is opening up enough of a leak that I can get out. I just need it to stay open long enough for me to cross the breach and get to the abdicators. But if they kill him first, or he drops his connection, then... Uh, I tuned the rest out. I stopped focusing on the island and snapped back to reality. One of Shadows was fighting me still, but something had changed. His arms were shaking, and he was losing control of his muscles. A strained expression on his face. He was dying. No, you don't, Frecker, I growled. Not that easily, you don't. I flipped on my comm. Heather, I shouted, please tell me that you're out there. This dying bastard has a link between my head and the abjugators. 
I need that link to stay open, you hear me? Do whatever you can to make sure that door doesn't shut. I split my attention again to back to the island. I sent out the call to Heather and uh, holy crap! I planned on telling my doppelganger that I'd called in reinforcements, but uh, apparently that wasn't entirely necessary. In that brief span of time that I'd been gone, the man of war out in the water had stopped firing. It now drifted in the current and appeared to be unmanned. Behind it, the swirling vortex of the abjugators had dwindled from the size of a building to the size of a woman bent over on all fours straining. That's not a coincidental image, by the way. A woman made of gold light was stuck in the opening and straining with everything that she had to keep it from collapsing. Keep the fricker alive, my doppelganger said to me as he raced to the wooden barricade. Somehow he managed to find a hand and footholds between the loosely stacked timbers and started climbing. In a minute, he was up and over the wall. I heard the splash as he dived into the ocean beyond and started swimming. Seconds after he hit the water, I heard a cracking sound. I stood tiptoe and looked out to the ship beyond. The huge mast supporting the massive sails had split down the middle. The crack was from the weight of the sails tearing from the broken mast free of the ship. The ship was disintegrating. That could only mean... I flashed back to reality and stopped pushing down on the blade. Instead, I yanked upwards a mere instant before one of Shadow's arms went limp. The blade slipped and would have plunged into his heart if I hadn't reversed directions with my effort. As it was still managing to melt the shallow gouge into the remaining armor over his chest. The eye blackened flesh of his face slackened as he rolled to the side. The stump of his nose flared in his nostrils. He was breathing still, just barely. It ain't that freaking easy, I told him. I aimed the blade at his chest once more. That I didn't stab him this time. No, this time I cut. I cut away the burnt skin on top and through the mesh of armor below. I cut away the ceramic laminated bones of the ribcage before the harsh light of the world could sear it, before the flagging regenerative powers could seal the hole. I plunged my fist inside and gripped his naked heart with my gloved hand. You, I shouted as I squeezed once, are. I let go and squeezed again. Going. Squeeze and release. Do live. Squeeze and release long enough. Squeeze for me to make them regret fricking with me. Squeeze and release. Squeeze and release. Yeah, I had no freaking clue that would work, but one of shadows squirmed as I forced his heart to pump. I saw him cough and his heart under my hands fluttered once, twice, and he tried to die again. Nope. Squeeze and pump. Squeeze and pump. He shuddered, and his heart started up again. Feebly, his lungs expanded and contracted. He was breathing again. I shifted my attention once more to the island. I was my turn to run towards the barricade. I shoved my hands between the timbers and gripped, heaving and scrambling up the side, shoving my toes between the cracks when I could. Slowly and painfully, I eased myself up to the top and looked towards the vortex in the distance. The vortex was still there. In front of it was a battered and sinking warship, still afloat, but taking on water. The vortex had shrunk again, but the golden figure was struggling to maintain the gap. As I watched a familiar-looking person with gold and blue tattoos climbed out of the water and scrambled up the side of the sinking ship. He was on the deck in the blank of an eye and running. He raced towards the deck, trailing water as he ran and leapt off the edge. He sailed through the air and plunged headfirst into the vortex. I flashed back to reality. Okay, now I crossed. Now you can die. I gripped the heart tighter and pulled with both my feet on his chest. I kicked off with every bit of my remaining strength. I felt something rip a moment before exhaustion got the better of me. I was asleep before I even had time to hit the ground. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 108 Written by Semi Loki I was getting so used to the idea of waking up in a surgery pod after passing out that it was actually a little disappointing to wake up and find myself fully dressed and stretched out on a cot. I hurt everywhere, particularly in the ribs, but it was mostly a dull ache, sort of what you might expect if you climbed a ladder in the moon without the explosive decompression part. Extraordinary. A voice I didn't recognize gasped. He's almost fully recovered. Debatable. I counted as I sat up. My ribs protested as the action, but I did it anyway. Easy there, tiger. I heard Lee say as he put a restraining hand on my shoulder. You've got some pretty nasty bruises and your suit hasn't got your blood sugar level stabilized. Blood sugar? 
I asked and I blinked my eyes. Do you mean I passed out because I was hungry? No. Lee corrected me. You were hungry. The Ron suit makes a physical signs, but you were out of it in the sterile landscape, pushing your body harder than it should be able to sustain. Your suit couldn't find raw materials to supplement you, so uh, once the adrenaline levels ebbed, you crashed. Most extraordinary, the mysterious voice repeated. I looked up past Lee to find the source of it. I didn't see it at first, just some weird-looking fern that seemed Joker had draped some white coat over. Then the fern moved its fronds and shuffled closer to me. Your species has a remarkable regenerative properties. It commented as it ran a leaf across my face. It tickled my nose and I had to fight back the urge to sneeze. I've been checking on you periodically and have done my rounds, he explained. I apologize for my bluntness, but your injuries were considered non-life-threatening and our medical facilities were strained to capacity with more serious wounds. Your companion stated that if I allowed you to rest, you would be fine. I haven't begun treatment for you yet and have healed considerably on your own. In a few days, I predict that you would be at 98% normal function. Doc Robert here is really impressed with our biology, Lee translated for me. Robert, I asked. Your companion, l l li he has suggested I adopt a human name as you would have difficulties pronouncing my own, the phone explained. My real name is... What followed was a weird series of leaf rustling sounds. However, it added, as your friend's suggestion, you may address me as Robert. I shot Lee a glance. He gave me a bland poker face. Robert, I prompted. Well, Lee said at last, he's from a foreign land. An immigrant, you might say. Actually, Dr. Robert quipped, I'm transplanted a two overseer when I was a little seedling, as soon as I could leave the home soil, in fact. As I did my maturation on overseer, I'm legally considered a native of... Another time, Doc, Lee interrupted. I need to get Jason here up to speed, and I'm sure that you still have patience to work with. Oh... Robert nodded. Of course, such a dreadful thing. Malcryeth will almost certainly have to tend in prison colony. Not really his fault with the chimeric mind control. Still, it is most upsetting. Chimeric mind control, I asked. Do you know about that? I looked at Lee. This time, his hand on my shoulder urged me to my feet. You've got a lot of catching up to do, he explained. The last few hours have been pretty busy around here. I jumped to my feet and Dr. Robert emitted a delighted squeak. Perhaps when you have recovered, you wouldn't permit me to take a sample of your blood. The firm asked, hopefully. I would love to more fully study your biology and... Uh, I held up my arm to it. Don't take too much, I said absently. The fern didn't move and I almost kicked myself. Sorry, I said. You probably can't punch through the Ron suit. Um, I guess my neck would be the best place to draw it from. You are still healing. It said, if I draw blood from you now, you won't you get weaker. That'll delay the healing process. Not really, Lee explained. We have quite a bit more blood than we strictly need, in fact. We are injured with excess blood flushes the contamination out the wounds. As long as you don't make more than, say, a hundredth of his total blood volume, I doubt you would even notice it. I raised an eyebrow. He shrugged. I figured we'd go conservative, he said. You probably could lose a tenth and not be too bad, shape. Extraordinary, Robert gasped. And would you donate tissue as well? Lee seemed to be taken aback by that. I grinned at him. What? I asked. You're okay with donating my blood, but get squeamish by submitting your own. He glared at me. No, he said. Just the idea of him sticking a needle in the back of my neck is a... Uh... Needle? The phone interrupted. You expect me to pierce the skin with a needle? Your kind is surprisingly casual about the idea of inflicting additional injury upon yourselves. I believe I would understand why your friend was able to defeat the Chimera. A knot of tension in my shoulders loosened. So he is really dead this time, I asked. For good. That tends to happen when your heart is several feet away from your body, he replied. But yes, don't think the Complex or the Chimera tech can bring him back. Hell, I doubt the Ron tech could bring up the challenge. When you ripped out his heart and after you left a gaping hole in his chest that wouldn't close up. The radiation outside is pretty intense and... Uh, well, they all have a metallic armor hiding underneath their skin. The result was, um, interesting. I felt something cool touch the back of my neck. Robert was standing back there, so I assumed he was drawing blood. It didn't hurt, so I ignored it. It cooked him, I asked. It set him on fire. 
the plant physician explained. The radiation resulted in an electrical current running under the skin that heated up the skin to the point of rupture. When the heat caused the skin to peel away from the skull, exposing more metal beneath it, there was a spark that ignited the oxygen streaming in his armor. As I understand it, it's your friend here located you by following the trail of smoke. That's not exactly true, Lee countered. I didn't see the smoke until I was almost on top of them, and even then the fire didn't really get going on until after I lopped off his arms and legs with Jason's plasma blade. I sort of piled them all on top of the fire like kindling. You chopped him up and set him on fire? I asked, after I ripped out his heart. I also took a video of it and uploaded it to the archives, he added. I made sure to make it clear that he was armed and armored, and you still kicked his freaking rear. Hopefully, the Chimera will be getting a status update any minute now. Archives? I asked. Like I said, he remarked with a shrug, as Robert stepped behind me with a small silver cylinder at the back of Lee's neck. You've got a lot to catch up on. Like, just a wild example. The abjugators are gone. Then now, the archives. I thought back to my muddled memories and final moments of one of Shadow's life. Manually pumping his heart to keep him alive as a conduit to maintain the conduit that he had created between my brain and the abjugators. I remembered seeing Heather step in and force the connection to stay open. The program. Heather! I looked at Lee wild-eyed. Heather! I said. I called out to her and asked her to push. Last time it gave her a seizure. He held up his hands to stall me from babbling any more. One of Shadows wasn't really in peak condition to offer much resistance, she said slowly. She came out of it okay. She recovered before you did. No seizures this time, but I don't think it was a fun experience for her either. She was on the floor screaming in pain when it happened. Professor and I had to fight everyone off while she fought to, well, do whatever she was doing. Fortunately, it wasn't that much of a fight. We knocked about a dozen of them on their rears right around the time the archives started spilling their guts and overloading whatever the hell the Comflux used for the communications network. It was too much to take in all at once. What? I asked. Start over. I don't get what you're saying. To my surprise, it wasn't Lee who came to my rescue, but the ever-patient Dr. Robert again. Human Jason, he said patiently. Your friend here states you had a, uh, a program, as he called it, that was in your mind, and you forced the abjugators to absorb it. The fern walked in front of us again. He was carrying two silver tubes in his fronds. More out of curiosity than discomfort, which there was none, by the way. I reached out back and stroked the back of my neck. It came back without a trace of blood. Nice! Like one of those Star Trek hypos in reverse, I thought. Kind of, I explained. I'm not entirely clear on what it was. The super sentient said the abjugators were constructs of pure thought, and this was something that, well, humanity had been working on since they made an early attempt to mess on other skulls. I didn't really get it either. I'm afraid no one really does, the plant explained, and it'll take some time before the archives finishes answering their current queue of questions, and we can move on to asking them fresh ones. From what we can determine, however, is that, based upon what your friends have told us, your program altered the job functions of the educators. Previously, they viewed their roles as arbiters of our galaxy. They tried to maintain a static state that made their jobs easier. If society changes or power dynamics change, they had a lot to adapt. Keeping things the same is easier and requires less computation. What? I asked. Where are you going with this? Lee spoke up. Notice how most aliens aren't terribly creative, he asked, and how slow they are to innovate. That's not entirely the natural order of things. The abjugators stepped in and made sure that no to contain the progress as much as possible. They would sabotage promising areas of research or alter the records to mislead people. They would play elaborate political games to make sure that no one really got ahead. They even created the never-ending war where the Conflux and Chimera would keep nipping at an easy way of resetting the game board when things got out of hand. Get out of hand, he nodded. Progress is slow, Robert spoke up, but even beings as powerful as the abjugators cannot stop all advancement. Random factors add up and threaten to spill over and disrupt the perfectly static state that they craved. When they felt threatened, they would provoke a chimera into another wave of invasion. The fourth wave, I breathed out. This war was because the abjugators wanted to distract someone from something. Yes, the plant agreed. We do not know what exactly. It has been suggested that your professor, Mardukai, that your earliest radio transmissions may have been intercepted by the abjugators. And they panicked. 
Your species is one they could not control. They had done their best to hide you and contain you. The larger portion of your species, those upon the sphere, were hindered in their advancement by the placement of the Fey and lack of material resources. But, as for your own planet, they believe that you have been exterminated or, uh, at the very least, suffering from so great a setback that it would take you many millions of years to recover. Instead, they find a few thousand years later that you are shooting your presence into the stars. You mean... We caused this, I stammered. You're saying that old episodes of I Love Lucy may have destroyed the galaxy. Lucy? B shouted in a mock Latin accent. You got some explaining to do. Robert's top branches twisted in side by side as he was shifting his gaze between us. He then went on. In essence, Robert answered the last. We believe that it may have been so, even if it had been suggested that you may have simply accelerated a plan that had already been set in motion. The destruction of the galaxy would have had a greater impact on the elements that the abjugators had definitely controlling. The envoy, the fair traders, the run in particular. We think that the goal was to force an all-out assault on the remaining quadrant that would be habitable, like a mirror section, and force conflict between the various factions until more easily managed balance of powers resulted. What? I asked. Until each side bombed the others back to the Stone Age, Lee translated, they wanted everyone to pull out the stalls of stops and tear everything down. We destroyed each other until a handful of survivors were struggling just to stay alive on their worn, torn planets, and they crash landed on. Oh, was all that I could say as I tried to digest this. Most of this is still speculation. Robert went on, we're still combing through the data the archives are regurgitating. What data? I asked, mostly just for something to say. Millions of years of suppressing advancement, Lee said. Millions of years of people asking questions and getting no answers. Now they're all being answered at once. Oh, crap, I gasped. He nodded. We fricked things up good this time, he agreed. But uh, for once, it may be for the better. The archives aren't answering questions in particular order. I think when you um infected those first few, they started yapping about what they knew while spreading the virus to the others. As more abjugators are brought in and start babbling about what they know, some has a lot of really detailed data as useless. Some of it, though, is actually helpful. That's why we're not under arrest. One of the things they started yapping about was their part in the entire plot on how they tried to set up us for extermination. And they believed it, I asked. Hard to argue with the results, he said with a shrug, particularly when Milcry is speaking up on top of our behalf and confessing to his own part in the affair. A sad situation, Robert agreed. He will most likely spend the remainder of his life under arrest. I said as much to him when I examined him earlier. He stated that no prison in the entire conflux could be more punishing than the prison he's endured inside his own mind. I couldn't think of a word to say. Robert once more came to my rescue. Thank you, he said at last as he held up the cylinders. All these samples, now that the archives have begun to answer some of our unanswered medical questions, I hope that between that and what I can learn from your remarkable physiology to begin my own research into new areas of regeneration. Um, I said, you're welcome. Um, I don't suppose that you know where I might be able to find my friends, do you? I believe that they are still in the council chambers discussing the terms of the treaty, the physician said simply. Treaty? I squeaked in surprise. Like I said, he went on as he shoved me towards the door, you have a lot of catching up to do. With our multiple healings and consequent rejuvenations that she received, I thought I caught a glimpse of some of the beauty that Professor Medikai had held onto in the days of her youth. I was wrong. I'd never seen how beautiful that woman really was until I entered the council chambers. She stood there in a the dead center of an enormous room. High above her, a domed ceiling showed the ever-changing view of the stars in the galaxy. Zooming in here, or flashing information there, it was mesmerizing. Or rather, it should have been. The feat of technology that should have been a marvel, as much art as it was for a source of information, and not an eye in the house was looking at it. Nor did they look at the still-smoking crater with the ruined data lactins that had been chairs for high council. Every eye, human or otherwise, was fixed upon one thing. One person. Professor Madagai. It was impossible to look away. 
She strolled coolly and purposely as she had paced the floor before the small council. Her hands moved with graceful arcs as she spoke. Her eyes blazed with a fire that I'd never seen before. Physically, she looked the same as the last time I saw her. Just, well, more so. More focused, more determined, more incredibly alive than I'd ever seen her before. It was like I had only seen her sleepwalking and, for once, I was seeing her awake. This was her set as a scientist, her as a teacher, her as a savior of mankind. Here she was in all her majesty, and I could only gape at the stunned awe. He has displayed sentience time and time again, she declared evenly. She did not shout, nor was she voice amplified. Her words carried across the room anyway. They struck with a weight, as if each one was carved from granite and were being delivered by hand as a supreme word upon high. He has, she said, demonstrated proof of life. He is not your property to claim, nor is he the property of the chimera to seize. I maintain that the Diablade has demonstrated himself to be his own person on more than one occasion. More importantly, he risked his own capture at the hands of the chimera. A fate, I must stress, that would certainly have resulted in his own destruction in the best-case scenario. That would have been the best he could hope for. His erasure as a being capable of thought and empathy was more likely as they forced him to be complicit to their plot of destruction. Still, he risked this. Why? Because he was the right thing to do. He allied himself with life, with freedom, with preservation of this galaxy. How many of you can do the same? How many would do the same? You treat this as a matter of a resource, a warship to be summoned into battle. That is not what the Diablade is, and your refusal to acknowledge that damns you all. Would you trade the very foundation of the conflux with the security of an extra gun? I saw a hundred different faces showing their own species' reactions to shame. Still, it wasn't enough. One creature, something that looked like a shaved mink with stilt legs, made a feeble attempt to thwart her. This is a battleship, it said, a one that could destroy entire worlds as easily as you could knock over a drinking vessel. We cannot allow this thing to loose itself upon the conflux until we are sure of its intentions. It is not warmly allied with the conflux. I would like to think I realized the horror of its words the moment it said them that the stilt-legged in mine wished to recall the last sentence if it could. Neither am I, the professor said simply. My friends and I are from the Ron. My planet is a sphere, both of which your precious conflux saw fit to ignore and leave to the Chimera as playthings. Remain and allied. Your lives and homes are at risk if you wish to talk fealty. Are you truly that petty? You want the Ron to devote their efforts to saving you. Show mercy to your, your conflux it would never show to beings that it thought were lesser than itself. And this is how you persuade them. By enslaving a sentient being and demanding that everyone prove their loyalty to you. I felt someone tap my shoulder and with a great effort I turned around to find myself facing Jack. She smiled at me. Come on, she urged me. I need to get you and Lee out of here. But I stammered I wanna. I know, Jack said, cutting me off. I told Heather to tone it down a bit, but I think that she's holding on to a grudge. I blinked and, uh, just like that, it was a spell that had been broken. I glanced behind me and saw Madakai there still marching and talking. She was still beautiful, still convincing, her words still had meaning. But somehow, there was something different about it. Some other mysticism was lost. Heather's doing something, I asked. It wasn't really a question. Kind of, Jack admitted with a grimace. Believe me, Mandakai is still doing the heavy lifting here. I think she'll sell them no matter what. She's, um... This is wrong, I interrupted. Mandakai is up there telling them not to be hypocrites and compromise with their principles, and here we are doing the same thing. We know, Jack said angrily. Believe me, we know. But look, step out of the room for a moment so that we can talk about this. You sound like you're going to start shouting and screw everything up if you do. I wanted to start shouting to screw everything up. Instead... I followed her out of the room and into the corridor beyond. Lee followed me. Judging by the way he stomped his feet, he wasn't any happier about the matter. It's not just her, Jack said quickly before I could get a word in edgewise. There are over a dozen telepathic species in the galaxy. Every one of them has representatives in there helping her out. You probably wouldn't even notice if Heather wasn't there as she seems to be the only one who is able to, in any way, work with human minds and even she can't get a grip on you if you are aware of it. 
You shook it off without even trying. Is that supposed to make me feel better? I snapped. It's supposed to make you realize that your feeling now is not you and you're not being pushed. She clarified because I need you to understand that whatever you decide after this, no matter what, it's you, okay? No one is inside your head but you right now. I glared at her and crossed my arms over my chest. Go on, I said at last. She licked her lips and took a moment to think about what she wanted to say, to gather her thoughts before launching into the next part. It wasn't easy. Jason, do you know much about history? She asked at last. Not my favorite subject, I admitted. She winced. Okay, she said. Do you at least remember this much? The aftermath of World War I and the bankrupt and humiliated Germany. Seriously, I asked. We're going to invoke Godwin's law now. She either got the reference or, at least, saw that I understood what she was leading up to. Jason, she said simply, these people have just found out that they've been oppressed for a million of years. They were so oppressed that they didn't even realize it. Their government is in a tailspin and their communications lines are jammed. There is a threat that they are going to die any day now and no one has any idea where to even begin with how to stop this. Does this sound familiar? So that makes it okay for us to do the psychic brainwashing, I asked. We're not, Jack protested. Heather doesn't have that much control anyway than the others. Well, that's a lot of targets. They're not doing that. The psychics are just, um, calming fears, making everyone more open to the voice of reason. That's what I meant by the professor is still doing the heavy lifting out there. She's using every trick she knows to keep them from rioting, because as far as the sunrise, there is someone in that group who wouldn't mind sporting a toothbrush moustache if he senses things are getting out of control. I glared at her. Quack is a church leader, she reminded me. What do you think he'd tell people to do? He already has a congregation that listens to him, that believes he knows what is right and what is wrong. If they get desperate and they are afraid, what would he do? Tell them to calm down and that we can get through this, or would he tell them to hightail it for chimera space with guns blazing? I unfolded my arms and didn't say anything. I didn't agree with her, but that didn't mean that she wasn't wrong either. I don't like this, I said at last. None of us do, Jack said. The professor wanted to go in there without the psychic calming of the council. She wanted to do it the hard way, but in the end, there were too many voices demanding war. Too many people seeing that there's such a chance to gain power and rise to the top. We had to do something before it gathered too much inertia to stop. I felt sick to my stomach and looked away from her. I didn't want to see her eyes. Still, she was right about something else, too. I felt it happening inside my head. I wanted to tell myself it was coming from outside, but uh, no, I knew it was a lie. It was me. It was all me. I was coming around to their side, and I hated myself for it. Frick! I snarled. What the hell is wrong with us? How can we be right with such a thing? We're as bad as the freaking Chimera. No, he said. We're worse than the Chimera. We have always been. Jack nodded and cleared her throat. Professor Madakai, she said at last, is going to ask her for the quarantine around Earth to be reinstated. She's arguing that Earth isn't ready for contact, that it'd be like when the barbarians tried to sack Rome. Even if they conquered Rome, they lost. They became no different from the Romans they conquered. They lost themselves to the thing that was Rome. That's what she's telling them, that the only way to preserve our culture is to isolate it. But, I concluded, she's not doing it to save us, she's doing it to save them. I didn't even try to phrase that as a question. Now is Jack's turn to refuse to meet my eyes. We're never going to be able to go back home, are we? Lee asked. No, Jack admitted. I don't think we are. Lee looked over his shoulder at the room beyond, at the captivated audience hanging onto every word uttered by the woman he loved. Good, he said at last. He walked away and left me alone with Jack. It's all right for you to hate us for this, she said at last. We're not too proud of it ourselves. I shook my head. I don't hate you, I said. I hate me. Frick, first humans allowed out into the galaxy in thousands of years, and we break the whole damn thing. She tried to smile at me. It was a ghostly parody of humor. Maybe after the universe has had a few years to grow up, she said at last, then we can start letting humans out to play. I looked at her. Just a thought, she said, and then added with a touch more cheerfulness. Technically speaking, as we're not part of the conflux, the quarantine doesn't apply to us. 
We only have to follow the Ron laws. Officially, we're ambassadors. I grunted. You know what rich folks do with ambassadors on Earth? I asked. They cut one end off and set them on fire. She frowned. I think you lost me, she confessed. I shrugged. Never mind, I said at last. Just idle speculation that there's still a lot of room for things to turn out awful for us. Does it ever do otherwise? She asked. She had a point. Okay, only one thing to do. Moral relativism is not my strong point, I said at last. Before the psychic coop goes very far, I think we need to bring our friends to keep us in check. Jason, Jack said quietly, we don't have friends. We have a couple, I corrected her. In fact, I'm going to go talk to one right now. Davy's okay with taking a few months off for a rather interesting house call. Hopefully, it'll go over exactly like a balloon made out of rather heavy and dense metal. You mean, won't go over like a lead balloon, she corrected me. I know what I'm about. I said and then pointed to the council chamber. Go talk to the professor, tell her we need to get them to stall and making any real important decisions for a few months. It's a government, then it should be easy. Then meet me in the hangar in, oh, let's say two hours with everyone who wants to go on a field trip on the Dire Blade. The Dire Blade, she asked. I nodded. The professor just argued he's free to come and go as he pleases, I said. Now is the time to let them prove that. Now go. I need to talk and uproot someone, and we don't want it to be here when the levy breaks. You're mixing metaphors again. She snapped as she walked away. All of my love, I muttered as I headed in the opposite direction. As it turned out, getting permission to leave with the dire blade really was the least of our problems. Jack was right in that aspect. We were, officially speaking, diplomats from the Ron Empire, and we really didn't have an answer to the Conflux law. So, for the second time in my life, I stole the dire blade from the Conflux and, uh, much like the last time, the circumstances of who actually belonged to was sort of questionable, so it was debatable whether or not I actually did a classified as stealing. Getting Robert Planch to join our crew actually turned out to be a little trickier, however. Once I told him part of the reason I wanted him to join, he changed his tune quickly. Such a thing has never been attempted before, he protested when I first suggested it. Yes, I agreed. I realized that, but the Ron didn't just stash weapons in their cubbyhole for us. If you come with us, then you get to play with magic wand that is way ahead of anything the Conflux can provide you. After that, it was mostly a matter of finding the other doctors willing to take out patients for him, as most of them was involved in keeping patients stable long enough for surgery pod to become available. That actually wasn't terribly difficult to manage. Although, full physicians like Dr. Robert were hard to come by, there were more than enough surgical technicians hanging around that one physician could, in theory, manage the entire process so long as the technicians were certified on automated first aid kits and those didn't run out before the process was over. As the most serious cases were already in the pods, that didn't seem like me. So Robert was able to step away mid-crisis with only minimal grumbling from his colleagues. Afterwards, it was mostly a matter of accelerating the moon-sized ship towards the Nexus gates and building up speed over the next 50 days for our first of several metaspace jumps. Being back in the Dire Blade was the closest thing I had to coming home in, uh, hell. I don't know how long. Relatively speaking, we hadn't lived on board for that long, but still, it was familiar. I felt good and had even permitted Dire Blade to talk to me in resuming into training program against the Dalek things. Since he last worked with me, I'd actually been in a few hand-to-hand combat situations, and as such, I thought I would do better against the meat grinders. I did, right up until he told me that he was taking them off half speed and stepping it up to level 2. Damn it, I hate it when my best friends try to kill me. Otherwise, things on the diablay quickly settled into a sort of routine. Jack, Shide, and Heather joined me on our expedition. Lee and the Professor wanted to come, but Professor was afraid to leave Overseer alone for that long. And Lee's penis wasn't about to go that long without being attended to. I mean, Lee stayed behind to offer support and, um, protection? Right. His request for lodgings in the area of soundproof walls was, um, obviously related to the Professor needing a quiet place to practice her speeches. That's it. Yeah. Believe what you want. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 109. Written by Semi Logie. For the first weeks or so, Jack and Shy joined me in the gym and my training against the Daleks. It was always a bit awkward training in the room with them. 
Shai proved himself to be pretty proficient with the Wuta on his back, and Jack was certainly vicious enough on her own right, but there always seemed to be some sort of tension in the air between them. They were cordial, friendly, they invited me to join in the exercises with them whenever I wanted, but I always got the feeling that they'd be happier if I was elsewhere. So, I started training on another deck. Lastly, there was Heather. If things were awkward between Jack and Shide with me in the room, then there was positively grating when Heather and I found ourselves in the same room. Maybe I was just disappointed with her in the psychotic assault of Overseer. Maybe it was just simply that after years of fantasizing about her, now that I finally got to be with her, my feelings had changed. She was no longer some object of perfection outside my grasp. She was a human being. The same desires and anxieties, the same needs, the same wants. That's not to say that we avoided each other, nor were things strictly platonic. No, we just seemed to never be in the same room except when the time when we had a mood for sex. Otherwise, we just went on with our lives and let the others do the same. I got the feeling that we were both using the other, a pressure release system for pent-up frustrations and boredom. If that was the case, then we were both surprisingly okay with it. I don't know. All I know is that I spent a lot of time with the dire blade alone in my cabin reading and uh, occasionally checking the common network to see if the archives had finished spilling their guts. Sometimes there'd be a scratch at the door and Heather and I would play a no closed version of human paddleball. Me, mostly, I spent my time alone. Jason, the dire murmured softly one day, as if trying to wake me up. I looked up from my reading. Hmm? I asked, then it occurred to me that this was a human thing to do and probably wouldn't understand the significance of that. I was preparing myself for the actual articulation of the sentence when he replied. I've detected a particle drift pattern where they I infer may be the exhaust from drones, he said. Drones? I asked, as I failed to see the significance. Drones were used in your retrieval, he answered. Ordinarily, a few drones can be lost due to an happenstance, but there seems to be heading out a system. Ah... Now I get it. Clever. Can you follow them? I asked. With projected speeds that we should intercept within the next hour, the dyer explained. He had learned our time units and saying one Mississippi to represent a second. I don't know how accurate they were, but it worked well enough most of the time. I tossed the data pad aside and the history of the chimeric first encounter with the Ron. Summary is... Ah! I'm on fire! And ran towards the galley. If I hurried, I could grab something to eat before the showtime. Call the others, I ordered as I left my cabin, particularly Heather. We're going to need her. I anticipated this and have requested each of them to meet us in the cafeteria. Blade replied, your science officer is already there. Randy, I said, I didn't think that she needed to eat. She doesn't, Blade said, but the larger viewing area appeals to her. I rounded the corner, and then, sure enough, I saw one of the walls had been converted into a view screen already, before it stood a robotic creature. The robot had a basic shape of one of the Darnick training bots, sort of like a giant salt shaker, but this one had equipped with two sets of arms, one below the other, and equipped with a very delicate manipulating device. The robot stared at the screen using a variety of scanners. Only a few of these were limited by normal visual spectrum. Hi, Valson, I greeted, adapting to your new body, yet. Hello, Jason, she replied flatly. It is an adjustment, but, uh, yes, I do believe I'm finding comfort in this, or else your doctor has simply altered my ability to know my own discomfort. She spoke in English now. Dyer had supplied most other parts, and, uh, despite a rather heroic effort by the good doctor, there was still a rather extensive brain damage, and we had to compensate by artificial means. As her speech centers were in the mainly damaged areas, Daya saw no reason to have her use her own language and simply dumped the lexicon of English upon her. It was a weird sensation hearing her speak English, particularly as her voice was almost entirely devoid of inflection. But at the end of the day, Volson was still there, just not entirely as I remember her. Well, I said, when we get back to Ron's space, we can see about equipping you with a new body. The doctor did his best, but, uh, well... You had been left adrift in space for months there. You were sort of messed up. Apologies are not necessary, she replied. My recovery is greater than I reasoned to expect. However, I did not quite understand why you felt it was necessary. Well, I said as I turned to my own attention to the screen. First and most important, I think we owed it to you. Owed me? She asked. Her voice was still fat, but still, I thought that there was a faint flicker of emotion. Curiosity, I think. 
or maybe it was just my imagination or wishful thinking. You were the first friend we had, I explained as I walked over to one of the food dispensers and keyed in the sequence I hoped that would be tasty. You were loyal to us, you helped us, but in the end, we let you down. I understand it was Captain Quack who left me to die, she corrected me. We should have been able to do something about it, I insisted. We should have been able to stop it, make him heal you up and bring you back, but he didn't want to risk you staining the reputation he was trying to repair. What became of Captain Quack? she asked. Oh, he's alive and well, I said as a shrug and a ball of something steamed hot and blue popped down in front of me. It wasn't what I intended to order. I grabbed a spoon anyway and sat through one of my tables. You spared him? Really didn't get much of a choice, I said. By the time I dispatched Shadows and the others knocked out his pet police force back into the censors, the program had caused the archives to start spitting their guts. The church has taken a big hit and, uh, well... Since Quack is slow to catch up with reality, he was already screaming his version of things and trying to push the agenda of exterminating all life on Earth, right about the same time that Malcrimuth was denouncing the church as being one of the many dupes in the Chimera plot. Continuing to sound the Chimera party platform did not really do him any favors. Was he arrested? she asked. Worse, Jack said as she wandered into the room and shied, trailing behind her. They had apparently caught the tail end of the discussion. Worse than prison, the robot asked as it turned towards the two new arrivals. He's a kavodging ambassador now, Shite said. Him and that tentacly kavodger. Silthus, I supplied. No thanks, he said, eyeing the bowl of soup. I'll just get something the food dispenser provides instead. Just a kavodging hint, though. If it's kavodging blue, then maybe you need to see a doctor. I shoved the bowl aside. I wasn't worth arguing with him. Particularly as, judging by the smell, he may have been onto something. He was promoted then, Volson asked. An ambassador to the Chimera, Jack explained. They were put in an Alcoria and pointed in the direction of the heart of Chimera territory. They're supposed to discuss the terms of the Chimera surrender. Nalcorias are slow ships, Volson remarked. They can only make a small metaspace jumps and only after a period of a hundred days of acceleration. It'll take them many years to arrive in the Chimera space. Maybe by then we'll actually have the terms for the surrender to relate to them, I agreed. They may encounter hostiles along the way, she went on. Null couriers are typically not armed or armored. That's a good point, I said. I'll have to bring that up along the way. She turned her head to face me more squarely. This is your suggestion, she asked. Well, I think she asked. With a synthetic voice, it was hard to tell. No, I said. They came up with this idea all on their own. Liar, Heather muttered as she entered the room. I'm innocent here, I said. There was a motion to put forth by a member of the low council. After you pulled him into a corner and threatened to break his legs and force him to deep throat them if he didn't, she pointed out. And, um, the council just happened to be in a uniquely receptive state of mind when I proposed was put forth. I went on as it hadn't heard her. It was all very much above board. Balson was quiet for a moment. My species, she said at last, is not unfamiliar with the concept of vengeance. Indeed, at one time we were quite well known for it. My former commander, Quack, is a good example of this archaic mindset where even a minor slight would require a response of hostile punishment. She paused and regarded me for one of her scanners. It is a pity, she continued, that he viewed humans as a threat to be routed rather than a source of education. If he had, however, he might have realized that our concept of vengeance is nothing compared to the ideas your species harbors. He could have learned very much from you. She now turned her head to address the room. If I state that I feel avenged, do you promise to seek no further action against my former captain? She asked. Can't make that promise, I said. Sorry, Heather replied with a shake of her head. Kavaj him, Shide added. Jack just glared in reply. I see, Valson said. Well, I know better than to argue against the human nature. Besides, I will confess to an atypical struggle with seeking the moral high ground. Dr. Roberts chose that moment to walk into the room and, uh, as such, he was greeted with a rackish cheer. He babbled happily and warm greeting. I didn't have the heart to correct him and let him know that it wasn't intended for him, so I let him have his moment. You see, there was a second reason, Volson pointed out. Right, I said as I clapped my hands together in front of me and it's actually the reason that I wanted Heather and the good doctor to join us here. I was under the impression that I had already completed my task that you brought me along for. Robert protested. That was only half of it, I said. 
As for you, Wilson, I would hate for you to leave this life without seeing this next part. Objects in range, Dyer announced with the usual impeccable timing. The view on the screen shifted and I heard a collective gasp. I may have been a part of it. It was Jack who broke the silence. It's holding drones in its tentacles, the declared. It's using them as, um, rockets to propel it out of the system. I smiled. No, I said, but he has the unable to move on his own before because of a cut away his wings. I wonder how it managed to capture then reprogram the drones. I thought it was blind. It'll take years for it to get out of the system at this rate, Heather nodded. It's slow and painful. I thought it wanted to die. Circumstances change, Bolson said cryptically. Sometimes even a partial existence can be difficult to surrender. I stirred. Heather, I asked, do you think you can call out to it? What? She asked with a start. Well, I guess I can sort of feel its mind even from here. It's large and powerful. I, um, I think I can say something. Good, I said with a nod. Say hello and tell it, um... Here I paused and shot a glance at the fur knight Dr. Robert. He was hopping up and down with excitement. Tell her we've got someone here who isn't eager to offer his help, I said. We may not be able to get a super sentient back to 100%, but maybe we can fix some of the damage. I looked at Dr. Roberts. I hope you didn't lose that wand, I said. No, he said. Of course not. Oh, oh, I need to have a chip manufacture me a suit. I need to stamp outside the ship to examine this marvelous creature up close. In due time, Doctor, Heather said, as her voice had a strange reverberating beat to it. I glanced in her direction and felt my breath catch my throat. Calm down, Heather said in a normal voice. He asked permission. This is just a little faster than me responding what he is saying to you. Um, okay, I said. Then I guess it's good to talk to you again. And you too, Jason, Heather said as the eerie voice once more. I do, however, confess to some surprise at hearing you again. Also, youth, your changed circumstances, Heather here in particular. I shot her a look. Yeah, I said. She's all full of surprises. Nice jetpacks, Jack added. Thank you, Jacqueline, the super sentient replied. Your ship is also very impressive. Um, I said. It had taken months to arrive. During all that time, you'd think that I would have considered that what to say if I'd actually found the super sentient. But then, you'd be wrong. Jason, the voice said calmly, Heather has appraised me of much of your situation. Much has gone on that I was not fully aware of. First of all, let me be the first to warn you that I do not know the way to stop the metaspace bombs the Chimera detonated. I do not think even the abjugators completely understand how they functioned. My heart sank. So the galaxy really is doomed, I stammered. I did not say that, she corrected me. I said I do not know of a way. Super sentients are not all-knowing. Our minds are vast, not limitless. No, hope is not lost. I do not think it will be easy, but I think I might make a few suggestions that may help. Such as? Such as the sphere, she said. You already deduced that it also functioned as a ship. What you did not fathom was the reason for it. The sphere was meant to serve as both a time capsule and as a generation ship. Why? I asked. Because even if our long life spans, the super sentient replied, crossing the gulf between galaxies is too great of a challenge. We would starve if we were even attempted it. I blinked in surprise. The sphere is an intergalactic ship, I sputtered. In the next three million years or so, the super sentient answered, the sphere will intersect with a stellar nursery. The sphere was designed to harness this raw material to use it to recharge the star at its core so that it could continue to provide light and energy for the time it takes to cross the gulf. Furthermore, even though your ship successfully opened the door the Chimera had forced closed, the sphere itself is much more difficult to damage. I think that it may as well survive a metaspace leakage. Heather broke in with her own voice. It's a lifeboat, she said, still grinning, her face twisted and deeper voice than her own. I believe that it may be, the super sentient agreed. And as such, I suggest you appoint Master Shire to be in charge of determining the criteria for who can immigrate and under what circumstances. It is his home, after all, and he would be the best judge of how to minimize the impact upon his world. Convergius, Shide shouted, I'm in charge of a planet. This would be a fallback plan if all else fails, the sentient added, but I believe it is a high probability of success. In the meantime, I think we should further explore another option that you may have been overlooking. The Ron, the Conflux, and even the Fair Traders seem to accept the destruction of the galaxy as unstoppable. 
However, there was another group that did not accept the Chimera's inevitable victory. The Envoy, I agreed, but no one knows how to contact them. No, no one in the Conflux had agreed. However, the Ron Empire is far larger and covers larger areas than the Conflux do not. I think that as our first priority is requesting the Ron Empire to help locate the Envoy and find out what they know. Jack was remaining quiet up until now, but something now prompted it to speak. So you keep saying we, she pointed out. Does that mean that you'll help us? Of course, Jacqueline, the super sentient agreed. The galaxy is my home as well. I plan on joining you when you return to the fold of the Ron Empire, if for no other reason than to further distance myself from the Chimera. I thought about that. Um, Dyer, I asked at last, can we haul something that big behind us? Your ship is the size of a moon, the super sentient answered for it. I believe I can establish a stable orbit if no other means presents themselves. That seemed to, to settle the matter. Okay, I said with a shrug. Dyer, see if you can help our guest achieve a stable orbit and work on helping the Dark Finder suit. I want him out there patching up our friend before we first met a space jump. Where are we going? Heather asked. First, all back to Overseer, I said, just to pick up the Professor and Lee and drop off the good doc. I would prefer to remain with the company, Robert said quickly. If he wants to go back, I amended. Otherwise, he's welcome to join us. After we pick up the rest, we're going to point this giant bucket towards Ron's space and stomp on the accelerator. Good plan, Heather said. Her words sounded optimistic, but she was frowning. I just hope it works, she added, before I could say anything to her face that contorted and responded to herself. Heather, she chided herself with a super sentient's voice. The odds of the Chimera destroying this galaxy are actually remarkably small if you only take into one piece of data. Which is, Heather inclined her head in a normal voice. Humans seem to be very much inclined to stop it. The super sentient's voice said from her throat, so far. Being on the opposite side of humanity has not appeared to work out terribly well for anyone. End of chapter. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.